Emily Lamb and I will be presenting the cases to the board today for their consideration at today's public hearing. Members of the public at this time, if you would please take a minute to turn off your cell phones or other devices, silent them, um, silence them, do something so that they're not interrupting the hearing so the board consider all the cases without interruption. We would appreciate that. <clears throat> For these public hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to the cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearings. In today's hearings, staff will present the site plans, photographs, maps, and other documents that comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, the board will hear those speaking, wishing to speak in support of the appeal. If anyone is here in opposition, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition presents its testimony, the, board, uh, the appellant will have an opportunity for rebuttal. According to BZA rules, the appellant has five minutes for a presentation if there is no opposition present. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow ten minutes for each side to present testimony. I would point out um, that is 10 minutes, a cumulative 10 minutes, so if there's more than one person in opposition to a case, the 10 minutes is combined and shared. After the opposition, um, or appellant rather, in their rebuttal testimony, if they want to take any, make sure you reserve any um, time from the allotted 10 minutes initially given to you. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on the case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, section 174180. All section numbers that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1, 1998. I will introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it a part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because the BZA meetings are recorded for the Metro Nashville Network, it's imperative that anyone addressing the board please come forward, sit at the table, and speak into the microphone. All speakers should identify themselves by name and address before uh, making their desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board to establish a quorum. The, court also, the code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be de deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to Chancery or Circuit Court within 60 days of the hearing date. <clears throat> Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later time by means of a show cause order before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, before we move on, if I may deviate slightly from our usual agenda, as the board members know, but members of the public may not know, Today is the chairman's last board meeting after 13 years of serving on the board. It, it would be Mr. Harper's last meeting, but apparently his last meeting was <laughs> two weeks ago. Oh, he's um, still got four hours to show up. <laughs> so uh, Mr. Harper has been on the board for 10 years. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I turn it over to the zoning administrator who would like to say something, I just want to thank you for your time. You have served your city well. You have donated. Un uncountable, if that's a word. Um, too Hundreds many to count of hours, hours, maybe a thousand. Too many hours to count um, of preparation and for the meetings, um, listening to the meetings, giving careful consideration. You've served your city well, and we thank you for that. For members of the public, um, the De uh, Department of Codes Director Bill Herbert and I, John Michaels, the Zoning Administrator, are very appreciative to Mr. Harper and to Mr. Ewing for more than a decade of service to their city as members of the Board of Zoning Appeals. David Harper was appointed to the BZA in, in 2009 by then-Mayor Carl Dean. With David's expert eye as an architect for the construction details and development challenges that various cases bring to the BZA, 
His professional expertise has been a tremendous benefit for our board for a number of years now. Following in the great tradition of his predecessor, Dick King, uh, we have all benefited from the type of expertise and detail orientation that David has brought to the board. Moreover, his, David's keen ability to recognize how to redirect and refocus our discussions in some of the more complicated and uh, uh, potentially burdensome cases that could get bogged down was always extremely helpful and greatly appreciated as well. We thank David Harper for his years of service to the city, and we thank him for being a friend to all of us through the years of his service. Uh, David Ewing was appointed to the Board of Zoning Appeals in 2006 by then Mayor Bill Purcell. Having served on Metro boards and commissions for several years prior to that appointment, David instantly let expertise to our board with regard to uh, the knowledge of the right procedures and the right approach and the common sense solutions that can often be afforded to many of the most difficult cases here at the BZA. As a bonus, perhaps for all of us, David has also substantially increased the knowledge that we all have for Nashville's history. For every citizen that's ever walked into this Sunny West Conference Center, you know more about the city of Nashville because of David Ewing and the information he's been able to share with us in so many crucial moments in his unofficial role as Nashville's favorite historian. Having served as chairman since 2016, it's worthy of note that David has led the BZA through the largest building boom in the history of the city of Nashville. To wit, David was the chairman who oversaw 1,374 BZA cases in this three years and change that he's been chairman. By way of comparison, in the 10 years preceding, the BZA only heard a little over 1,200 cases. Welcome to modern Nashville. And a tremendous city like Nashville needs a tremendous chairman of the board for its Board of Zoning Appeals. We have been fortunate to have precisely that. And so we thank David Ewing today for his service to our city. And as a commemoration of the occasion, we wanted to share one small gift. Any Nashvilleian or even visitor to the city of Nashville will capably recognize the thousands of these red signs that you've seen in yards across the city. And today it's only appropriate to recognize our outgoing chairman, David Ewing, on today's date for his 13 years of dedicated service to the people of Nashville as a distinguished member of our Board of Zoning Appeals these last 13 years. Again, thank you to Chairman David Ewing. <laughs> Thank you, John Michael and staff and everyone here. I'm not sure if this got posted, John Michael, properly. So does that mean I get to stay since it wasn't <laughs> properly noticed? In all seriousness, thank you. And um, I am going to think about everybody but the Academy because after being here 13 years, there's lots of people to thank and I am just grateful for everyone that makes these meetings and has served on this board with me too. I'd first, I wouldn't be here without former mayors of Nashville, and I'd like to start thanking them. Um, John Michael mentioned uh, my service to the city started in 1995 with Mayor Phil Bredesen, who appointed a young lawyer to the Metro Historical Commission. So I am grateful for him of uh, selecting me back then and getting my 20, I'm on my 24th year of service to the city going. Uh, it was Mayor Bill Purcell who decided to move me to the Historic Zoning Commission. I see David Harper here who missed his, uh, John Michael, you're gonna have to repeat all that. Um, Mayor Purcell appointed me to the Historic Zoning Commission and then when Karen Johnson, uh, our friend Alma Sanford's good friend, moved on to bigger and better things with school board and the Metro Council, he appointed me to her seat here on the BZA. And that is why I've been here for longer than the two terms that the Metro Code requires because her unexpired term did not count. Um, Carl Dean reappointed me to this board twice and I'd like to thank him and his staff for all the work they did. Um, and then of course, current Mayor Briley for being just supportive of me and uh, keeping me on this board. He could obviously move me. And uh, he also recently appointed me to a committee to look at the Morris Building. But I would like to thank each individual BZA member, uh, starting with David Harper, who you missed your, you, know, you might have done that on purpose. So I guess I have served with David the longest on this board. 
and you know he's just been a treat to serve with you know i'm not an architect and you know we really lean on our architects for all sorts of uh, cases and issues and you know he's always looking at things in a different way um, sometimes dissenting which is good um, you know we have those six to one votes but those kind of things matter and always kind of as John Michael said, steering our discussion back to where it should be. So, uh, David, I'm going to miss serving with you here, and congratulations to 10 years. So, Alma, um, you've been a delight to work with. Um, I've worked with you politically before, but being on this board has just been great, too, and your, your passion for the city, too, your equal knowledge of history, and yes, I will embarrass you and say you are a Ewing cousin, and we, we're, we are um, always um, finding something that we have in common. Um, and, you know, your leadership in the women's suffrage memorial in Centennial Park, and the exciting anniversary that's coming up, and I look forward to working with you on that too as well. So we will work together in the future. And um, our newest board member, Ross Pepper, uh, a lawyer who lives in the old neighborhood that I used to live in, Hillsborough Village, I appreciate your service to this board, your knowledge on real estate, your enthusiasm to be here, and, and like I said, as, a, as someone that specializes in all sorts of law, but you know, a lot, knows a lot about real estate, you know, that's very helpful too. David, we've also served on this board, you know, for a long, long time. You know, the, making up the, there's only going to be one David after today. You know, we used to have the three Davids. We almost had a quorum of Davids here. But you have been um, kind of like our former chairman, Chris Whitson, someone that brings people together, that finds middle ground, and, and asks tough questions too. And um, a lot of people, you know, respect your comments and thank you for just your long-term service to this board. And Cindy, my fellow member of the bar here, um, who I often sit by outside for these long meetings, um, thank you for your service, your insightfulness, and sharp questions. These are kind of, it's almost like being in front of a judge sometimes. And, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're trying to figure out what is best based on the code in the city. So thank you for everything that you've done and your friendship too. And finally, Christine, thank you for, now I think Christine is probably the most prepared person for every meeting. She reads all these things, she takes notes, and then asks great questions. So I'm gonna miss being up here with you. So the other, and I'd also like to mention Dick King, our, our late member who, um, was here almost 10 years and uh, just recently died and you know he was a delight to be around um, members i'd also like to think of course the members of the metro council i wouldn't be here because the mayor appoints these people and the council approves them and of course our frequent visitors to the bza you have scott over there kathleen john cooper is here today but the other frequent visitors include brett colby um you know we just couldn't do this meeting without you Chant, uh, the Metro Nashville Network. This is the great network and they're behind this wall over here and they help us, you know, they give us transparency. They bring this meeting to people that can't be here and then they archive it for years and years to come. So I think there are about 10 years of BZA meetings on the Metro Nashville Network YouTube channel. So thank you to the Metro Nashville Network. Not only do they cover us and planning and the council, um, it's, that's a very important part. And the people at home that have been watching these meetings, you know, stay involved with government, get involved. You know, there's a future BZA member in a chair and a future mayor at home watching on Metro Nashville Network. Our great staff, Jessica over here. Jessica, you keep us on time. You keep us uh, informed with all the documents and material. And we just truly couldn't do these meetings without you. Um, and you have to sit through all these meetings as we do too as well. So really appreciate everything. And I saw Sean over here earlier. Sean um, basically and Jessica made sure that we were wireless, I mean uh, paperless, so we don't kill a bunch of trees now and the paper that we generate is very minimal. So thank you again. Um, John Michael. John Michael has been um, Part, well, I'll, I'll start by thinking zoning administrator. See, the name of this room is named after Sunny West, our great zoning administrator of many, many years in Metro government, who was followed by Bill Herbert, and then, of course, followed by John Michael. Um, 
Bill Herbert served us very well before moving on to head of codes. You know, I guess there's always life after the BVA, which is hopeful for me. Um, John Michael has, um, has been a constant force on this um, administration and this um, board answers good questions, kind of knows when to kind of uh, keep the meeting flowing and has always been even in preparation to this meeting, you know, giving us as a board the right material and the right judgment. We might overturn you from time to time, John Michael, but we have never not believed in you, so we appreciate that. And um, Emily Lamb. Emily, thanks for filling the shoes of John Michael. I know um, many people have been in this role. You, you were our lawyer first, and now you're our administrator, and thanks for running these meetings well and uh, quickly. But most of the time, you know, sometimes we go on and on as the chair is going on and on right now. So we've had other lawyers. I'd like to thank the, the former lawyers, uh, starting with Doug Sloan. When I joined the board, Doug Sloan was on the board. Kathy Sinback was on the board. Susan Jones was our lawyer next, then John Michael, Emily, and now we have Quan. So Quan, I know you will do well in this role. Um, our court reporters, yes, I'm thinking everybody. We need a transcript of many of these meetings, particularly our appellate lawyers who think that our rulings are wrong. That transcript is very important when they, they go up to another place. We live in a different time nowadays. We have different things. Security is very important for our meetings, and I really am grateful for the security that is here every meeting, and that makes these meetings go smoothly and protects all of us, not only board members, but you all out in the public. The Planning Commission gives us recommendations. Lucy and her staff, which includes Michael, who gives us a lot of advice on sidewalks, have been just really go-to people. The, of course, I mentioned getting overturned, the Chancery Court judges, you know, please don't be too mean to us most of the time. I think um, we have been overturned on occasion since I've been here for 13 years, and I think I've only been mentioned a couple times in uh, appellate rulings of things that I, they, I said that the court said was wrong. And speaking of court, Metro Legal. Metro Legal has been the um, great guiding force of uh, the city and also takes many of our appellate cases and defends them up in Chancery Court. And I think there's only one time they so disagreed with what we did here, they decided we're, <laughs> we're appealing your ruling. So um, thank you for Metro Legal for all of that. Um, BZA has had three homes since I've been here. It started off in the Howard School over there when they remodeled it. We went out to Southeast and then we're back here in the sunny West. It's been great here and um, thank you to the Metropolitan School Board and the Police Department and every other place that we've been. Last year we had a record six ele elections in Metro history. So we have now, um, so we were, needless to say, displaced for democracy many times last year. So I'm grateful for the people that allow us to do this. Joey Hargis, I saw Joey Hargis back there who used to run our meetings. Thank you for doing all of that. And the light schedule, as John Michael said, before the It City boom that you were with. Uh, Stefan, our, um, our, our for urban forester, um, the members of the media, who I know they're not here for me, but print and television, I think they've been fair to us and good to us, and once again, more transparency that we welcome. These meetings are open to the public, they're open to the media, and we're just very appreciative of that. And last, I will conclude by saying hi to the people that watch us here and at home, the viewers, and thank them. But uh, actually, finally, is the applicants. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for you applicants. And I always considered that I had two roles on the BZA, is to listen and to ask good questions. And I know most of you all are just taxpayers trying to get some improvements done and make our city better. And we appreciate you coming here, listening to us, and pleading with your cases. As Tim Garrett, the former council person, used to always say when a BZA member was confirmed, you are the lawbreakers. 
all of all of you are the lawbreakers. I'm like, why are we the lawbreakers? Because the law says this, and you let the people do this. So he would always joke to us about, you know, the code says one thing, but that's what the BZA is. We, if you want your variance, if you want your special exception, I'm looking at Kathleen that says, we are not the board of forgiveness, but um, we are the board of variances. So um, it has been an honor and a pleasure to serve you all uh, for 13 years in the BZA, and I appreciate everyone's um, uh, patience and attention, and Jessica didn't buzz me, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Emily, back to the regularly scheduled meeting. People have things they want in fr for us today. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in the proper order. All appellants have been notified by certified mail and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. Before we move on to the consent agenda, I do have some um, announcements regarding cases that have been deferred and withdrawn. Case 2019-012 involving property at 1306 Gartland Avenue has been deferred to April 4th. Won't be my problem. <laughs> Case 2019-086, involving property at 1500 Charlotte Avenue. Um, the request for the parking variance has been withdrawn. And then case 2019-098, involving property at 915B Ramsey Street, has been deferred to April 18th. Okay. The last one was 2019-098. So is... 8-6, the... 8 six, y'all previously granted, there were two requests, one for landscape buffer variance and one for parking variance. Y'all granted the landscape buffer. So we don't need to hear it? Parking variance, no. right. I was just clarifying that okay. the, the landscape buffer still remains, that variance that was granted still remains, but the parking variance request has been withdrawn. Oh, I didn't... Yeah, Gartland. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. For members of the public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at each of its meetings. Our board mem one board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the requested action by the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, then the case is recommended to the board for approval. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to one of those cases, please stand up, make sure I can see you so that we can remove the case from the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. Mr. Chairman, these are the cases that have been recommended for the consent agenda. Case 2019-105, involving property at 901 6th Avenue South. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2019-105? Seeing none, the next case recommended for the consent agenda is 2019-109, involving property at 326 Duke Street. Is there anyone here in ca uh, opposition to case 2019-109? Next case, 2019-110, involving property at 335 Harding Place. Anyone here in opposition to case 2019-110? Next case, 2019-112, involving property at 1128 McFerrin Avenue. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2019-112? And finally, case 2019-115, involving property at 1200 North 2nd Street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 115? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, to review the cases on the consent agenda are as follows. Case 2019-105, 109, 110, 112, and 115. Okay, those cases have been properly moved to the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Members of the public, if your case was just approved on the consent agenda, you're free to stay, but you are welcome to go. Please give our staff until Monday to process all the paperwork in order to give you the um, permit for which you've applied. Mr. Chairman, before we move on to the cases to be heard, we would like to take the opportunity to recognize any elected officials that are here who would like to speak. Um, I saw Councilmember Murphy. Would you like to address the board now? Thank you. I appreciate y'all letting us go first. I usually wait for my cases, but have another constituent meeting this afternoon to get to. So I first wanted to lend my opposition 
to case number 2019-054. It is in Councilman Kendall's district. I spoke to him Tuesday at council to let him know that I had opposition to this, um, to this variance request. Um, as you may be aware, and I know that you will be hearing from neighbors around this area today, um, my father's bar, Wind in the Willows, <laughs> was actually right next to this where they are requesting a variance. And so kind of on behalf of my father and the history here on that street, um, my concern is, is really countywide. I mean, I think with the stats that were read earlier, um, it, it's no secret and no surprise that our historic structures and our historic neighborhoods and history of Nashville, um, and I think it's only fitting and proper that it's still, that you chairman are still here tonight. Um, this the, the surrounding buildings have significant history. And if you allow this variance to go through, I think that damages and hurts part of Nashville history. And you might have a chance here to kind of save some of that by not allowing the views of these historic buildings surrounding this neighborhood to be destroyed. As we see, um, a lot of the buildings in this area are being bought and sold um, just a few blocks over. We know that the gold rush was recently closed down, who knows what the, history, the, the future is for that building. And so my concern is, is that as we let variances go through where there's not a lot of infrastructure and not a lot of um, streetscape and, um, and lanes and roads width there, that the concern is, is that you're damaging the surrounding neighborhood and buildings that have been there and served our community for a long time. So I wanted y'all to keep that in mind when you go through that case. And again, that is where um, Mike Murphy's historic Wind in the Willows bar was um, a little bit before I was alive and in his life. I don't think that a father had jived with owning that type of establishment though. So now back to my district, um, case number 2019-104. I was actually surprised to still see this on the agenda. Um, when I think what the planning commission staff, what the planning department staff is doing is great, trying to work out some of these variances and requests ahead of time um, by offering to applicants kind of, well, you know, this this area is somewhere that already has a sidewalk, and so instead of having to pay the total in lieu fee, let's find some more common ground, because I think common ground is what really your job is, my job is on the council, and that kind of thing. Um, but just because you buy a property that has already been upgraded with taxpayer dollars in this situation, a large project, the Murphy Road Roundabout, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, you know, obviously we don't want that torn up to change the sidewalks, but when you're lucky enough to purchase a property or have a property that's already been improved by taxpayer dollars, to then request not to pay your fair share of the infrastructure costs for sidewalks in the surrounding area and your impact zone and things like that, I find it a little bit offensive. And I didn't get a chance to take this to the Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association for an official vote because I am surprised that they are continuing with their request to not pay anything at all for sidewalks. Um, so I think I can speak a little bit for Sylvan Park Neighborhood. Um, their association didn't take a vote, but I'm sure if I took this to them, they would tell you that an in lieu fee should be paid here. Um, I think this is a place that they shouldn't tear up the infrastructure to rebuild, but uh, I find it offensive that they're continuing on to request that they pay nothing because taxpayer dollars have already built the infrastructure there for them. Um, so that's something I know that you hear my my catchphrase of you're not the board of forgiveness, but I also think that I, I need to come up with something catchy too for just because you're fortunate enough that taxpayers have already paid for your sidewalk you shouldn't be asking to not pay your fair share too. So you're, so you're comfortable with planning's recommendation that the applicant pay the in lieu fee for Murphy Road for just that part of the frontage of their property because I think it's a corner, is that I right? think that's good enough. Of course, I would prefer that if you're not building the sidewalk, you pay all of the fee, but I understand there's a creek there, it's already built out, you know, I can tolerate a compromise, but really, honestly, the fact that they aren't even agreeing to do that, um, that they're, I mean, what planning offered them is a reduced fee, and they're still requesting to do less than that, I find it offensive to the neighborhood. So I would, um, request that, I mean, I had told planning that I was okay with their recommendation, but I mean, I don't, I'm not going to stay for their presentation, but you know, y'all might want to consider tweaking that to have them pay for the whole thing. Um, 
you know, I mean, we've got to, we're all in this together. And if we don't all help pay for sidewalks, we're never going to have them. So um, I think that covers everything in my district or districts surrounding me. Um, okay. And I appreciate your service. Mm, any questions for Council Lady Murphy? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and using the great privilege of being an at-large council member for the council, I wanted to come and thank you today for your service and to thank you for this tireless work um, and to congratulate you for all that you've done and to give appreciation for an underappreciated and vital public service that you all fill here. But David, your knowledge and background can't really be replaced. So I wanted to say that for all the council members um, and for the council. And then on a second smaller matter, I wanted, I've been asked by the community for the record in the case of 2019-095 that for six months last year, I was also the district one council member. Um, and as a, just as a find, finding a fact for the community to establish, did this matter come before the council or the council member in any way? While I was a council member, it did not. And so just when you come to that point in that discussion, um, while I was the district one council member, there, there, was no, there was no council involvement in any way on that rezoning decision. But, the, but that, that's a small matter compared to really how can we be grateful to all of you and David to you enough for all these years and all these uh, afternoons and nights in this building. Thank you very much. Councilman Cooper, thank you. Thank you. Councilman Davis, gonna miss our bi week, our twice a month kind of hearing about District 5 and. David, everybody's talked about how great you are. When it comes to codes, board of zoning appeals, yes, you're an awesome lawyer. Okay, I don't want the ego going to your head, but you are. And you've been a blessing and a joy. You've, in our city, even if we were able to magically give you millions and millions of dollars, it will never repay the service you've given us. But the most important thing, you've done a lot of important things, not just for my neighborhood or East Nashville or the city, but this is the top, okay? Without you, I would not have been able to rename Frederick Douglass Park the right way. And I gratefully, my community does, thank you for that. And, and that, that's, that, that's just so amazing because many times as African Americans, we get stuff stolen from us. And it's obvious to see that it was named after Frederick Douglass, but certain forces, especially now in the Trump era, say, no, it's not. This was Fred Flintstone Douglass or, or something even as silly as that, that people say that it was, but we all knew it. And you felt like a good lawyer, you found the evidence, and you found that the client, Frederick Douglass Park, was innocent. Yes, named by thank you. Mayor Hillary pleasure. House. Um, Councilman uh, Davis, um, the mayor has appointed me to a committee to look at the Morris Building, a block away from the courthouse, uh, how to save it. And I'm very passionate about that, and I'm going to bring a lot of energy to that. That is the last building standing in downtown Nashville, built by black people for black people. And it was built in 1925, designed by McKissick and McKissick, and was class A office space for a religious publishing company, a bank, and architects. And so I think it's all of us need to rally around saving that building and coming up with a use for it. And I'm glad that the, the mayor has taken the lead to identify that as an important asset to our city and appoint this group to look into that. I'm grateful that you're going to be involved. I'm sorry to make you put on your Superman cape again, but. <laughs> no, it's, but, it's but what believe, we do. It's what we do. I believe in you. Now, I'm here for two matters. Thank you for proving the other two matters in my district on consent. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm here for 216 um, Duke, which is case number 2019113. I'm asking that you grant their request because larger development is already going up on that street, and the larger development on the corner is building the sidewalks along that whole strip because I've, I felt like tacked in, and it's nothing against the builder of a larger development, but 
the community and I were like, when we did the rezoning, like, hey, if you're gonna build that many units, that's fine, but you need to do the sidewalks and just not do the ones in front of your development. So this other developer you're saying is building the entire street out, including in yes, front of this we, we, address? We, uh, many cases ago, we went through the same thing, and I got the old agreement SP from the planning department, and their development's already going up. It's right behind, Duke is right off of Dixon Road. Um, the big developer that you, if you drive by the Piglet Wiggly next to the post office mm -hmm. past Trinity, you'll see it going up. Now, I don't know when, they're gonna construct their sidewalks, but I know they don't, they're not gonna get their UNO use and occupancy permit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until that's done. So I'd rather pass the cost on to the larger, mm -hmm. more impactful development. You know, I'm sorry, Tom, it might be, might have, I think it was your client, I apologize. But um, I felt like that was, that was necessary. This next one is extremely important to me because 1105B, that's a regular citizen of mine. And he bought this house from another neighbor who we're gonna miss, but he bought this house and he's not able Which to- Which case are you talking about now? I apologize, 065. Okay. He bought this house and he has a dadu in the rear. He's living in the front house and he wants to lease the um, dadu out for Airbnb, which is legal, because he is living on the lot in the front house and he wants to <laughs> lease out his dadu. Um, and the previous owner had a permit, a legal permit for leasing out the dadu, which allowed, it's only 700 square feet, so not a lot of room for wild parties. So he needs to get his permit for the house, that, for, the, for, the dad, for the accessory dwelling in the rear, not his personal house. But I think it's by property, I'm not sure. But he's not breaking any of our rules. You know, it's just the transition from one homeowner to the next. And if you can wave, if, if, if I know commissioners, you work hard, you volunteer long hours, and I know you do the same thing code staff, but um, I'm gonna stick around for this one because it's for a regular citizen. Nothing against developers, but you know, you definitely, definitely wanna help those that voted you in and represent you. Okay. Thank you for your time, and David, we're gonna miss you. Thank you, any questions for Councilman Davis? Okay, we'll see you at the end of the meeting, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, two brief announcements that I failed to announce on the consent agenda and the deferral agenda. Okay. 2019-012, that's on the short-term rental docket, that has been deferred to April 4th. And case 2019-033, this was recommended for the consent and I failed to announce it with the others. Um, that is property at, let me tell you, 5738 Cane Ridge Road. So if we could solicit a vote to put that one on the consent agenda. Okay, that one moved back, moved to the consent agenda. Is there anyone here in opposition to that case? That one will move to the consent agenda. Is there a second? second. Oh, three, three. Is they, um, did they agree to planning's recommendations? They did agree to planning's recommendations. It was a sidewalk variance and they agreed to the recommendations. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of putting that on the consent agenda signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, passes. Okay. And now we will move um, on with our docket. Before we hear a case, the first item on the docket is the election of the board chair to take effect at the next meeting. Um, we, the board has decided, my understanding, the board has decided to elect the vice chair at the next meeting, but elect the chair today. So uh, okay. first we would... So this, this election will take, that person will take over as chair next meeting. So um, I would like to nominate David Taylor to be our chair coming up. Okay, motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of making David Taylor our new chairman of the BZA signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Congratulations. Well, thank you. You will get the gavel next time. <laughs> no, not, not, Ms. No, not, too, not too soon. Ms. Ms. Lamb. And now we are ready to move on to the cases. I believe we're gonna start with case 2019-089 involving property at 4136 Creek Trail Drive. This case was previously heard by the bo uh, board but failed to receive four votes. Is the appellant here? Okay, um, Mr. Chairman, this, um, 
case was previously heard. It's a request for a variance from front setback requirements. I would point out the public hearing has been closed. Sure. Yes. Um, and I would ask Mr. Chairman and Ms. Chappell, have you had an opportunity to review the video from this hearing? Okay. I have, yes. Okay, um, then we would solicit a vote on this particular case and see if we can get four affirmative votes. Okay, so this is, we're not opening up the public hearing, we're just having another vote on case 086, I mean 089, so those in favor of the front setback variance signify by saying aye, raising hands. Wait, hang aye. on, I'm sorry, did, did, we, did we take a vote at all last time? Yes. We did, I believe there was a motion to approve and it, failed three to two. Mm -hmm. Is that right? But the, my understanding is that only that, my understanding is that only those who were absent are to vote today. So we're, we're just taking it up again as a new oh, okay. So we'll take a so fresh motion and it, anybody can vote. That so you can vote here or so, watch I'm it. sorry, I'm having a hard time remembering the facts of the case. Yeah, so so the, the brief overview, this is the property, it's zoned RS-20. Here's the aerial in front of you, Mr. Harper, that might help. Um, this oh, is yes. a request okay. from us for a s setback variance. The street average is 68.5 feet and they're requesting 32 feet. This is the site plan. Um, I believe there was some testimony regarding the grading and the slope of the property. And these are the photos of the property. So um, in this situation, we typically solicit a, a new vote um, or a new motion rather and anyone who was at the last hearing or watched the video would be able to vote on that. And Mr. Harper, if you have any other questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Okay, so we're going to, this is the deliberation part, so uh, we're going to discuss now again. Well, I, I now I remember the case, uh, and I, I was in favor of the variance uh, because I, I think that by all the data submitted that it, it is an outlier uh, in terms of, of grade and, and some other circumstances, and I, I think that there is a, a clear hardship. Yeah, and, and I think I, I was of the, of the opinion that while it definitely had a case for a hardship given the uh, overwhelming and strong opposition from the neighbors and the lack of uh, proof that it couldn't be built to code, I mean, it wasn't that there's an easement. I mean, there's there's clearly topographical issues, but there was a lot of testimony in terms of potential damage to the uh, to the neighborhood and to uh, you know I, th I think they they had some um, you know the neighbors also and they they may have an issue outside of this board with their um, homeowner association uh, rules, but that again is outside the purview of this board. But to me, it was. Um, a situation where it was it was very possible and and there was testimony that was damaging to the neighborhood uh, by granting the variance any other discussion before we take a vote or have a motion is there a motion well i'll i'll reintroduce my motion to approve the setback given the uh, extreme uh, uh, slope of the site that is uh, not the same slope that is on the other properties according to the data submitted uh, and therefore is uh, worthy of a variance. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye and raise hands. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so three to three. So. Ms. Lamb, what happens when it's three to three? Uh, so again, failing to receive four firm, it remains open for 30 days. We can okay. push it to the next docket. Ms. Chapel, you may have an opportunity to watch the video at that point. Perhaps the new board members may have had an opportunity to watch the videos at that point. But either way, we can solicit another vote at the okay. next meeting and see if we come up with four affirmative ones. If we do not have four affirmative votes at the next meeting, it would be deemed denied by operation of law. Okay. What's next, Ms. Lamb? Next case is case 2019-054. Okay, well, before we get started, and I have to make fun of myself, as I've made fun of my colleagues before, that this is a case that I do work for the owners or the applicant, so I have to be Jeff Sessions today and recuse myself. So I will see you all later. 
So board members, you may remember this case. We have heard this um, a couple of times. Initially, they were requesting um, a special exception from the height and the build step back or step back and build to zone as well as a parking variance. Um, the height issue has been resolved. Y'all granted that uh, special exception. We're only here today on the parking variance. Um, Y'all heard extensive testimony at the last hearing. Um, I believe it was deferred for them to try to gather some more data, and I believe they're here with that. They have submitted some more paperwork. I'll let them um, respond to that. But just as a brief refresher, this is the zoning map showing you the zoning is MUGA. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding areas. This is the site plan. And then here are the current photos of the um, property. At the last meeting, um, they were requesting a reduction from 148 spaces to 70. I don't know if they have an updated request today, but was it 90? It was to 90. My, I'm sorry. 148 to 90. My mistake. I'll let the appellant come forward um, and address the board now. Uh, is there opposition to th this case present? Okay, so each side again will have 10 minutes to make their desired presentation. And again, just to reiterate for everybody, we're only discussing the parking today. Yeah, if you could, um, and, and all of the board members were present before, but if you want to just uh, remind us of, of where you are, what has changed since last time. And I know that you have a, uh, a parking agreement um, for, I think, up to 50 spaces. And to me, the obvious question is, why didn't you just do 58 <laughs> and, and, and not have to be here? Um, it sounds like with that agreement, we're talking about a variance of eight, of eight parking spots. So why was the agreement not 58? Uh, I will defer to the owner to respond to that. Um, um, we felt like 58 would have took care of the problem. In fact, 50. Um, so to answer your question, not don't really have a valid answer for that. But we felt like since last hearing, we didn't need 50 spots. We f felt like maybe 25 or 30 spots would have took care of it. We just want to go above that just to just to be safe. Okay. And yeah. What, and, and again, it, it's fair enough. It's what you're asking for, but uh, continue. And Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Did you identify yourself for the record? So, no, I did not. I apologize. Jay Patel, developer, 2209 22nd Avenue. Great, thank you. And, and I'm Scott Morton, um, Smith G Studio at uh, 1005 North 14th Street, East Nashville. Um, again, thank you all for your service, and um, especially Mr. Harper um, and uh, Mr. Ewing, of course, uh, for their years and years of service to this body. Um, we are here again to respond to your previous comments at the last meeting. Uh, we appreciate the guidance that we received at the last meeting and the thoughtful deliberation regarding our case. Um, just to remind everyone, and again, just to, to reiterate Mr. Taylor, the previous request was for a reduction in parking from the requirement of 148 spaces per the Metro Zoning Code. We are providing on-site 90 spaces, which is a, um, a net reduction of 58, which is 39% reduction. At the last meeting, um, we went through our former traffic study, um, the uh, analysis from our premier parking consultant, um, and we discussed that at, at length. And at the end of the meeting, it was requested by the board that um, while a reduction in parking could be appropriate here. The board would be more comfortable if there was a parking agreement in place to serve as a safety net um, in case that to ensure that that, that um, protection was there. Um, and so since that time, we have secured a signed parking agreement between the owner of the property and Premier Parking, which is in the packet before you, which as stated is for 50 spaces for an initial term of three years um, with renewable yearly contracts after the initial term. Um, the additional 50 spaces plus the provided spaces on site uh, would equal a total of 140 spaces available for parking for the development for all uses, including the retail and the hotel function. Um, as stated previously, the uh, required space is 148. 
we are providing capacity for up to 140 through the combination of on-site parking and the uh, off-site parking agreement spaces. And I think before um, you had said that you were, uh, well, we had we had asked if 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 a condition for the retail space, which included the retail and the restaurant use, uh, would be as presented. And I think to me, uh, as presented means that however you divvy up those spaces, that they can't have more than 25 required code spaces. That's how you presented it. I mean, you presented one retail with zero, one with some, one with some, the restaurant with some, it added up to 25 spots on your chart. Right. I don't really care how you divide it up, but I don't want you to, other than if you divided it up to get your, you know, the, in a way that would require more spaces and, and make that number higher after, you know, we gave you a variance. So, Certainly. Um, so that, I, I'm assuming that that is still an acceptable condition if we were to grant this variance. Of course, understood that if, if the parking demand and the use allocation increased the required number of spaces, we would have to come back to this board to, if there was a request for relief. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant at this time? Okay, you have six minutes and 48 seconds for rebuttal and we'll hear for, from the opposition. Thank you very much. If it please the commission, I'm Helen Rogers with Rogers, Cam and Che and it's our firm and our building that is next door. If you just took this development and ignored the entire neighborhood, maybe the solution they came up with would work. But I want you to look at the side of that building. What they have done, first of all, is that by building this building, they're taking 50 parking spaces out of the neighborhood. Secondly, they're now, because they don't want to build internal, because they could, they could build 70 parking spaces on a floor. But, and then they had an internal ramp. That was the first plan. They could build a second floor of parking and have 140 spaces in their building and have no impact on this neighborhood. But what this current plan does, if you look at it, is it has a ramp not in the building, but going through this little narrow alley. And if you look at the letters that Mr. Spanos and I sent you, you see that this is a small old alley, and it's not even a straight alley. It's an alley that goes side of our building behind Cafe Coco and Coco Greens, which are two businesses, where three dumpsters get dumped, where all our deliveries take place for those businesses, and then makes a 90 degree turn going through the parking um, premises of Premier Parking that they rent where my employees, seven of my employees park. And so you are, then going to put 90 cars a day in and out of this little alley on a small street. This is not a main drag. State Street is not a main drag. If you look at, again, the photographs that we submitted, you'll see there's barely space. Well, that's, let's see, that's 22nd Street. State Street is... There, yeah, that's that's State Street, and that's actually a generous looking because there's usually cars parked all the way up to the end of the street. But you, where the two sides, where there's two sets of parking on each side, there's barely room for two cars to get through. The edge, which is across the street from where this is going to be, has no um, ramp for deliveries. So UPS, FedEx, everybody blocks the street already to make deliveries. And so using this alley just creates a huge problem. I mean, they're coming out in the middle of the street. The alley Can is I, I, behind I that a, white truck. I have truck. a question about your, your comments on the alley. I mean, I don't know, I'm, I guess I'm not sure what uh, authority we have as a board I mean, it's a public alley, and so, and, and I know it's been used as uh, almost a private alley for the businesses around 
uh, that area, including yours, for quite a while. But I really don't know what um, authority we have to to say that uh, you know an, an adjacent neighbor can or cannot use or should or should not be able to use the alley. So well, they're not using it for access to their property. They're using it in lieu of an internal ramp. And so you're not supposed to approve variances that are going to have an adverse impact on the neighbors. Well, how do we get a delivery made? It's a one-way alley. You can't go both ways. So how do any of these businesses, how do you get an emergency vehicle in there when you've got valet parking going in and out all day long? I mean, it, you can't. In other words, by granting the variance and not require them to do what they really should do, which is put your parking in your building. And now you're going to dump 50 more cars out into what few parking spaces are left in the neighborhood. There's only 12 premier parking spaces on Elliston Place. That's it, 12. The rest are going to be much further down. They're going to park in the closest parking lot all the time. You're killing Elliston Place. Well, and I, I guess I'm, I, I understand that argument also, but as I mentioned at the very beginning of the hearing, had this applicant rented eight more parking spaces from Premier Parking, you wouldn't have the opportunity to make this argument and we wouldn't be hearing the case. They would be fully up to code at that point. And it's the code itself that allows folks to have parking outside of their premises. So I guess, I mean, I, and don't get me wrong, I, I, I'm a frequent customer of that area and understand how hard it is to find parking. and I, and I understand what you're saying, but I guess, I, again, it goes to uh, relevance to what we're trying to decide. It, how is that applicable to our argument? And help me understand that, because, uh, because the code allows people to park off-site and count that as their parking, and, and has, we've been, you know, they've been allowed, people have been allowed to do that for a long, long time. I, I do understand the issue. I, the, the point is their plan has a severe flaw to it. And the flaw is they're not addressing the parking within their own premises, which they could. Um, and their initial plan had the entrance to their parking at the very beginning of the alley, right toward the very front, which would have caused a lot less disruption. Um, but now they're basically using an alley as a ramp. And so that, that's our problem with it. And, the, the, and that was the main change between the first plan and the second plan was to get 20 more parking spaces. They uh, did away with the internal ramp. Well, they, yeah, well, they can't, yeah, they, they used the natural grade uh, and improving the alley. But uh, so, I, and I understand that, that it does uh, push folks to the alley. And it, and it does have an impact on you. And I, I understand that. It has a big that. impact <laughs> to all the neighborhood. Um, but anyway, that, that's our, is, our position primarily is with the current plan. Um, also somewhat worried about sight lines, but, you know, we... If, if, the, if, if this were approved and the alley, how many parking spaces do you have that access the alley? Nine. Nine? And you don't have any behind your building? Or, or those are the only parking spaces you have that access the alley? Are those the only parking spaces you have for your property? There, that yes. are on your property, the rest you rent That's from? That's it. There are, there are five <coughs> that are along the building and four in the back. They're a little set off a little more. The five along the building, they have to back into the alley. All of these parking, nine parking spaces back into the alley to come in and out. And, and there's no... The dumpsters there. And, 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 it, and it clearly is... is I'll say a major inconvenience, and you might have a stronger word than that uh, for it if the alley were closed during uh, construction, but you haven't seen any evidence that once the alley is open again after construction that those nine spaces would be impacted. They have told me verbally that they would not. I think given their plan, it would be impossible not to impact because of the one-way traffic issue. I mean, it, it's just, there's just no way to make it work. Any, any other questions? I did, was there any other, you, you had. There we go, I didn't want to light up. My name is George Spanos, 2205 State Street. I'm a partner at the law firm. Um, very briefly, 
I know you've read the letters. I know you guys look at everything we send. You've always had good questions off of it. One of the concerns that I just want to help clarify that Ms. Rogers spoke about, with, we keep saying the one-way alley. It, yes, you can go either way up or down the alley. The concern is that because this isn't a normal alley, it's not the kind of alley you see downtown going between two buildings from one street to the next, that it, it goes, if you look at the pictures I sent, I took a picture from down on State Street looking up into the alley, and then from the edge of our property looking into uh, Cocoa Greens, a, a dirt lot, that <laughs> turns into a dirt street, and with dumpsters down on two, both sides of the alley down towards the end before it makes that right-hand turn, that this isn't going to be the way anyone wants to get in or out, which is going to increase the traffic and make and provide that hardship that Ms. Rogers was trying to explain because of where these cars are coming from. Additionally, um, I know you've, again, we've read the letter. I don't want to get into, I'm not going to read it. Um, we don't have time. I'm not going to ask for the time for that. And 27. <laughs> well, I'm not going to read that fast for you. I know you've looked at it. But there are certain requirements for, the, for variances, and they all have to be met. And what we're hearing time and time again is we could do it. It just costs more. We don't want to do that. Whatever is being asked, it's, why don't you get the extra parking spaces? It costs more. Why don't you build enough parking on your property? It costs more. Why can't you comply with the local zoning codes? Because it costs more. I think that's been a common theme on this project. I think it's notable that there's a hotel development, depending on what side of the street you're on, about four blocks away, on 22nd Avenue down to Charlotte. I provided it in my letter. I gave you the site map and the, the parking uh, that they have, you know, they qualified for a 25% reduction for being in the UZO. Uh, they only asked for 20. So they went from a, a requirement of 168 to, I think it went down 35 spaces to 133. And they still put in 167 on their property. The difference is they're building to what the property allows. It, you know, that's, I think, what everyone's really required to do, build to what you're supposed to be able to fit on that piece of property. You know, if someone had half the square footage of their two lots that are combined and they wanted to put in a 10-story building, you'd say, well, you're not allowed to put in a 10-story building. But we really want to, and we'll put parking someplace. You can't do that. That's not what the property can fit. It's not what it's made for. And that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at a space that doesn't fit what's required. So they're saying, don't worry about it. It'd be costly to do this. It, money, money, it keeps coming back to that. But we have responsible neighbors down the street who no one's had a complaint about. And that project's been going on a long time, and they're building to what they have. And I think it's important to delineate that project versus the one we're talking about when they're on the same street. No, I think that I, I appreciate the point, and I guess you know. And I did read read uh, your letter, and and what I was trying to to distill through reading it was what, uh, and, and a lot of it was based on uh, your concern about. You know, you know, the damage to the neighbors from this project. And what I'm trying to distill is what part of the damage is based on the construction itself, which is really not in our purview, and what is based on the parking variance, which is the request being asked. And at this point, the parking variance is an eight-space parking variance, which is less than 10 percent. and. And again, I, I'm, I'm not sure why the applicant doesn't just rent eight more spaces and, and be done with it, uh, but that's not what they've asked. And so uh, if they get a variance or, you know, potential conditions, I think this is your opportunity to, to offer, if we were to, to, to give an eight-space variance, uh, you know, are there conditions that, as a neighbor, you think would be uh, important for the project? And am I thinking about it incorrectly in the sense that, were they to add another floor, a lot of the types of disturbances you talk about would still happen. If they added another floor to get their parking, which is what you'd ask to do, they're still going to close the alley. They're still going to uh, impact your parking. They're still going to add density to an area with less parking needs. Uh, 
So help, help me understand. No, if they added another floor, they would be self-contained. So three years from now, if Premier has sold off all their lots, our neighborhood won't be impacted. If they build the two stories and do an internal ramp, then they're only coming in and out of the very front of the alleyway and not impacting traffic up and down the alleyway. So if a, a truck is making a delivery it's got space to go and it's not impacting anyone. So all of the all of the problems basically are solved if they put their 140 spaces in their own building where it ought to be. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? We'll hear from the applicant. Thank you. Um, just quickly, um, as far as the so, I guess I guess the question is, you know, in, in a in a densely crowded area, you know, why would you not add another floor and have another seventy parking spots and have rental income and from neighbors and others that. Sure. Um, I mean, as we discussed at two previous meetings, um, we have really. The, the sole intent of reducing the parking demand is to reflect the, the market need and not to overbuild parking. Um, with the understanding of a parking study to understand today's market conditions, um, not 1998 um, approved board zoning appeal. So with that said, um, to answer your very <laughs> um, great question about why do we not just add eight spaces and avoid being here, I, I think it really goes back to what we discussed last time. Um, you know, we, the, I think we're willing and able to add more, eight more spaces, but I'm not certain procedurally if that will solve the ultimate problem. Um, the conversation that we had at the previous meeting was in reference to um, the zoning code requirements for a parking agreement. Um, the way that the zoning code reads, and, and I may need the um, zoning administrator's help in interpreting this, but the zoning code reads that a parking agreement must be put in place in perpetuity. Um, and I think the, the uh, requirement of perpetuity is what we had um, concern with. If we were able to demonstrate that the reduction would work in a three-year span, um, we obviously wouldn't want to be paying for 50 spaces uh, in perpetuity if the demand was, was, did not exist. Um, and so I, I do think, at least my understanding, is that even if we are able to add eight more spaces, that um, we we would be required in perpetuity for those 58 spaces. Um, so that's one thing. And the second thing I just wanted so, to- So you're, you're wanting the opportunity to, to re-petition to us at some point in the future to continue the variance or, or to reduce it based on uh, actual history. That's, that was the difference. And that's my understanding. And, and if, if I'm incorrect in, in that regard or my understanding of the zoning requirement of perpetuity, I'm, we are glad to uh, obviously re revisit that issue. Um, we, we clearly um, have respect for the adjacent property owners. Um, where did my piece of paper go? And do you, the, I think they, they had testified that you, that someone from the project had given them assurances that their nine spaces would not be impacted by uh, the improved alley that you all are proposing. Is, that is correct. That is correct. So, and uh, then, I mean, I'd we are not changing um, the grade of the alley. It's public right of way. We are not able through our, we don't have ownership of that property to change its um, shape, size, grade, um, height. And so we will be only working on our own property in that regard. Um, with that said, we are dedicating and improving per metro requirements. Uh, four feet of alley widening to expand the alley to a total of 16 feet in width um, as required per Metro Public Works standards uh, to expand that alleyway to their, their current market standards. Um, furthermore, you know, the, the alley entrance is, regardless of the ramping that was discussed, um, it is a requirement of the zoning uh, that we have our entrance on the alleyway. And so um, MUGA, which is our zoning, requires that all access be off of the alley. And so um, we're obviously, we, we didn't do that to um, try to take advantage of something else where we did that to meet the threshold of the zoning requirements. Um, and so the alleyway is 
you know, in our opinion, is very much functions as a normal alleyway. Uh, most alleyways within our, our city system operate in a yield condition. Um, the flow of cars from this facility will be very similar to that of hotels within downtown and other areas that have extremely similar, if not smaller, alleyways in many cases. And so um, we feel comfortable given precedent properties and other uh, cases that we'll be able to operate within our level of service that we need um, regarding the alleyway. And tell us, um, code requires a loading space inside the building. You've correct. provided that, one or two spaces? Yes, that's correct. Our loading space is at the back corner, um, to indicate on the plan at the intersection of the alleyway and um, State Street. Okay, and it's within the building. So correct. no one will be, delivery trucks won't be parking in the alley. And um, trash collection all, where, where's your dumpsters? Well, currently trash, trash collection is located um, on that same corner. Um, you know, we will have facilities for that. Inside the building, not on the alley? Correct. Any other, any other questions? I guess the only other uh, thought I had was, you know, it, it, I mean, I do think it is a, a, a pretty uh, important um, imposition on on the neighbor uh, to lose the alley during construction and especially the only parking spaces that they have on their property uh, if you do close the alley I mean is there a willingness to you know find nine spaces for your neighbor during the period that the alley is closed uh, I, I believe there's that um, please my name is Owen Sanford with Premier Parking. We're absolutely able to provide those spaces to them in the interim and can guarantee those spaces. Any other questions? Do you have anything else to add? Okay, we're, we will close the public hearing at this point and discuss. Thank you. Any, any thoughts? Uh, what we've done a long time is we have allowed people to make up their required parking with off-site parking. When, and this applicant has demonstrated that they are doing that at least for a 36-month period. Uh, they've also indicated a willingness to make sure that the use of the alley is not going to displace the parking here, and they're willing to hold their variant zoning to have the certain number of spots uh, tied to the hotel and its employees versus the tenants and their uh, necessary parking. So I believe, although I think the opposition has very well articulated problems that we're facing, I think the applicant has addressed what we have asked them to do during these hearings. Well, you know, and, and I don't, I, I, I think I would want to get the staff to clarify, I mean, it, it is not, we are not allowing them to use off-site parking. That is part of the code, right? I mean, the, 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 the code allows them to find alternative parking within a certain area. Is that, that's correct? That's right, right Mr. Taylor. It's codified at 17.20.080. That's where you get into off-site parking agreements. There's also shared parking agreements that are potentially applicable also under 17.20 of the code that can be utilized as a means of meeting a required parking count for any development, including one like this. So, so I mean, and the way I, I think that this boils down ultimately is they are required by code to either provide or uh, either to provide, provide on their property or through an agreement nearby 148 spots they're willing to provide 140 and what they're really asking us to do is to have that additional 50 come with the ability to reconsider that at a future date which most of these uh, that's that's the only really abnormal thing. The abnormal thing is that the shortage of eight spots and the ability to come back in three years to say, hey, we haven't used them at all and have the neighbors have an opportunity to say that's true or no, it's not true. And we either extend the requirement for the agreement or require it to be a permanent fixture. Is that, I believe that's what they're That's asking. generally our understanding of the presentation at this point. And Mr. Chairman, or Mr. Vice Chairman, usually when we um, see conditions to board orders, they are uh, the genesis of the board itself. You have thought of them. You have come up with them. 
occasionally we do have a recommended condition from an appellant, and that seems to be more the scenario here, and that would be appropriate for the board to consider whether they want to adopt that condition or not. Okay. Is that is everybody, everybody with us? We've heard it three different times, I think, at this point, and it's become confusing. So does anybody have a, a motion? Then I'll move that we uh, approve the variance uh, from parking from 148 spaces to 140 with the following conditions. The first is that the retail and restaurant space that is used in uh, the building uh, cannot have any more than 25 code required parking spaces, which is the number that they uh, submitted in their plan. I'm not uh, requiring them to divide it up exactly like they presented in the plan, but the way they provide, they did divide it, uh, took up 25 of the parking spaces and however they choose to divide it has to meet that or less. Uh, that the applicant also um, secure and uh, pay for reasonable, in, in reasonable proximity, preferably the, the uh, existing lot where the uh, neighbor is, uh, the adjacent neighbor in the alley uh, is parking their uh, extra cars, uh, the nine spaces that uh, they currently have in the alley for the duration that the alley is closed and or inaccessible due to this construction. And that the final condition of the variance is that uh, the, they have a parking agreement uh, for anything uh, between the 140 and what they provide on site, which is 90, uh, for at least three years, and that they are eligible to uh, come to the BZA after three years and request that that uh, requirement uh, be adjusted as appropriate. And I second it. Well, I was just going to say, I don't even know that the last part of that has to be a part of your motion. I think that's just the way the, the code operates. If they want to come at that time and apply for a variance, they can. So in, um, anybody, it was my understanding that, because they, they, they were really caught up in the in perpetuity aspect of it, and if anybody that has off-site parking can come at any time and ask for a variance, then I'm not sure why that became a stickler for us or them. So that was that was why I put that in there. Well, well technically, it, all the code requirements are in perpetuity. So, I mean. That's why we're going to miss you on the board. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the fire codes are in perpetuity. The fire codes might change, but what you build under is, you, it has to remain that, or you become or uncompliant. We would opine there's no problem in leaving the condition in, if that is the motion of the board. We agree with Mr. Poole's assessment, but there's no problem in leaving it in. Well, and, and, and the, the, the condition is just a signal that, that there is a willingness, that this was meant to um, serve as the backup and that there is a willingness, but you're right, it, it's redundant. So it we'll, we'll, doesn't hurt to be redundant, we'll leave it in. Um, that's, that is the motion. I did second it. And, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear, I'm sorry. I'm a, uh, so we have a motion, we have a second. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Any opposed? You opposed? So it passes five to one. And we will have a, a very short uh, five minute recess. Good luck. time so thank you clay for for that um, you know these meetings can be long but um, everyone needs their say so I think we have everyone back here and um, I would as we get back in session I would like to have the next case to be zero nine five that we start there The next case the board will hear, Mr. Chairman, at y'all's request to hear it out of order is case 2019-095 involving property at 3730 Amy Lynn Drive. 
This is a request for an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a permit to operate a concrete batch plant in the Our Zoning District. Um, I will defer to the zoning administrator to explain his position on this case, but I will show you briefly the zoning map here demonstrating the zoning is in fact IR on this property. Is the aerial photography showing you the property as well as the surrounding area? And then some current photos of the property across the street and up and down the street. Mr. Chairman, um, as is the custom with traditional item A cases, the zoning administrator just presents a brief overview of the position with regard to the cases being appealed. With the subject property, the request for use was for a concrete batch plant, um, a use that has, by all accounts, taken place uh, at the property in the past and is set up to take place presently. However, the question became one of whether or not the concrete batch plant was in fact a permitted use at this property. The current IR zoning district does not in fact allow the use, so then the more narrow question becomes, does, do they have protection under either the Tennessee Vested Rights Act of 2014, state law that was put in place to help uh, developers and land use questions be uh, settled in terms of what development rights apply vis-a-vis -vis when I got my building permit, when I got my final site plan approval, if applicable. On the other side, there was also the question of whether or not this was a legally non-conforming use under 137208 from the Tennessee Code Annotated. And those two points of analysis is what my letter outlines in, in substantive part from the, again, that's the January 18, 2019 letter, although I think it's a typo 2018 on the face of the letter. The letter largely speaks for itself in terms of the legal analysis, the points of fact that were reviewed to uh, make that analysis. Um, in particular, combining the documents that have been presented and the other evidence that have been provided, demonstrating the history of the property and the uses at that property. My review of that information then washed through the uh, cycle of those two pieces of state law and our local law reg regarding legally nonconforming uses and the history of the zoning at the property, gave me enough information to see that I did not have any demonstration of the prior use preceding the IR zoning at that subject property, which on the property highlighted in this picture dates back to the mid-70s, 75 in particular, I believe, and on the property to the immediate north there dates to the mid-80s. Um, it is possible that there would be documentation that would demonstrate a legally non-conforming use showing that the concrete batch plant operation had been in effect even before the IR zoning, which did not allow it. However, that's just not documentation that was presented to us for the review uh, at the end of 2018, leading into my end of the year review and eventual uh, mid-January letter from earlier this year. Again, the letter speaks in more detail as to my actual legal analysis. I know you've had that in your packet. That letter was, of course, made available to counsel for Smyrna Ready Mix, the interested party at the subject property, as well as to Mr. Leonardo, who is the attorney that represents a number of neighbors in the area in opposition to the project. Both of those parties are here today and be able to speak to their position with regard to the appeal and the opposition to the appeal. Um, however, I wanted to just kind of give my outline here at the front end. In summation, the facts provided did not demonstrate a legally nonconforming use nor did the facts provided demonstrate that there had been a vestment of the development rights pursuant to the Vested Rights Act of 2014 under state law. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to field those. Otherwise, I'll take my seat and let you hear from the appellant and the opponent. Are there any questions for our zoning administrator? Could, could you touch upon the, just briefly the fact that, uh, you mentioned about the, the building permit or the, the final site permit because of the fact that the equipment that is used and traditional construction versus this equipment? That, that's an important question, so I'm glad you asked. Obviously, the Vested Rights Act turns usually on two major circumstances that could vest you in your development rights. One, the issuance of a valid building permit, not the application for, not getting several sign-offs toward, but the actual finishing, completion, and receipt of a valid building permit. In some circumstances, we see this more in subdivision scenarios through the planning department and planning commission. A final site plan approval can also vest you in your development rights. For us at the code side, we more frequently see it as the issuance of a building permit. As Mr. Harper has noted, and it's worthy of consideration by all the board members, there is no building permit needed for concrete batch plant operations. It's not a building that is being <coughs> built per se, but instead equipment that is placed on a subject property in order to set up the operation. So 
the property owners and operators did not have the opportunity to get a building permit because it just wasn't applicable in this instance. Um, although there is, I think, electrical permits associated with the operation of the equipment that I do not doubt were in fact timely and properly issued, that um, trade permit, the electrical permit, is not enough to vest the property, in our opinion, under the Vested Rights Act. Any other questions for uh, the zoning administrator? And of course, he will be available, you know, throughout this whole case if you have any other questions. Um, as board members, remember this is an item A appeal, so we have the four-page letter that John Michael has written, and we are to determine whether the zoning administrator erred in this kind of ruling or not. And so, Ms. <coughs> Lamb, we, we're going to get started. So we're ready for the appellant to come forward. I believe Mr. White is here on behalf of the appellant. Um, is there any opposition here to this case? There is opposition to this case. Mr. Leonardo, are you here in opposition? Oh, okay. <laughs> Making sure. Um, so Mr. White, you'll have 10 minutes. If you and anyone else who speaks would please state your name. Oh, they asked for 15. I'm sorry. I missed that. At the that. outset, subject to the approval of the board, so we've asked for Board members, we are minutes. going to give both sides 15 minutes to argue since there are some length, lengthy legal issues and you have, of course, the record that, of the documents they've already submitted. So, Mr. White, get us started. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Tom White. I'm an attorney with Toon Entrican and White, 315 Dedrick Street. My law partner, George Dean, and I represent Smyrna Ready Mix, and Mr. Jeff Hollingshead, who's the CEO of that company, sits here to my right. Uh, with respect to the issue here today, there's really only one issue, and that is, uh, is the Smyrna Ready Mix plant that's operating down there a non-conforming use? Uh, and I want to be candid at the front end. Uh, at the time we first looked at this, I think the information that John Michael had, he made the right decision. At that time, there wasn't enough information there. Uh, now it's absolutely overwhelming to the fact that there was a concrete batching plant down there at the property long before the required period. So let me cover that. Uh, first, Tennessee law on uh, this is the 137208, the Nonconforming Property Act. You're familiar with the concept, once there's a lawful use, it can't be taken away if there's a change in the zoning. That's exactly what we've got right here. There's also authority under the Tennessee section that says you can continue, you can expand, you can remove and replace. I mean, it's very, very broad as to what you can do. With respect to the items mentioned there, there's also a clear caveat uh, under that section that indicates even if you cease the operation for 30 months, the opponent has to show that there's a willful and knowledgeable abandonment of that use that never took place here. My client, Smyrna Ready Mix, bought the property from the owners of Haley Harbor, who had a concrete batching plan on the property for many years. Uh, so there's no question, there was no intentional or voluntary abandonment. Uh, I also remind the board that we had a very similar matter in front of this board within the last two years. It was the Richland Creek case. Same matter took place, almost identical legal arguments. We tried the case in front of Chancellor Bonneman. Uh, she ruled this board had made the correct decision uh, that basically there was a non-conforming use recognized. It had been abandoned for far more than 30 months. But the chancellor said this board ruled correctly. There was no knowledgeable and intentional abandonment of the use on that site. This is an identical matter. Uh, with respect to the brief, we turned in a brief uh, to the members of the board, I know you're overwhelmed with paper, but I want to ask you just for a minute to turn to page two uh, of the legal presentation that we did. Uh, in that, uh, we... Can you give us a second to get there? I've, yeah, I would appreciate We have our that. new paperless system. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica and Sean. And it's at the very end, if you look, yeah. board members, it says Smyrna Ready Mix. You you're talking about the, the letter, your letter that talks about unclassified bill 1974, that page? That's it. And your letter of March 18th. That's it. Okay. And in and, and looking at that, if I could get you to turn to the first page after the three-page letter, there's a little map there. Uh, this is the indication for those that remember a gentleman named Charlie Raby. He was one of the chief assistants down here in Ferris Deep, was the head of planning. Uh, this is a, an official metro planning map, and I'll run through the history in a minute as to how we get to this. But if you look at that map, it's 1963. This is an official metro planning map. Uh, and you'll see that all the area on the south of the Cumberland River, that is towards town, is all zoned Industrial A. The site that we're talking about, which is between the Cumberland River and uh, Highway 12, is all unclassified. Every use is permissible. 
So you've got a clear designation from the Metro planning that from 1963 moving forward, it was unclassified. If you now go back to our page two, we spell out unclassified until 1974. So basically, uh, that's all Metro maps. The planning department and your staff thinks it might have been zoned even after that, but it doesn't make any difference. The earliest it became zoned uh, for the AR2A and then the IR is 1974-75. So the critical issue is what was taking place on this piece of property before those dates, 1974 and 1975. Uh, we looked exhaustively through every metro map. We're talking about 50, 60 years ago. So we went to the metro clerk's office, we went to the metro archives, went to the planning department. What we found is what I presented to you, and that's the Charlie Raby map. I don't think there's anything out there that contradicts that. So the, the question next is, uh, what experience was there for a concrete batch plant before 1974? Flip to the first three affidavits, uh, and they are... Okay, before you get to that, Mr. White, so I'm concentrating again on this map, and it says <coughs> urban service district limits. Now, that's a post-metro government phrase, right, Mr. Right. White? Correct. So this would have been after April 1st, 1963, Mayor Briley takes office, and basically the city divides up into general services and urban services. That's correct, and that's, and Charlie Raby and Ferris Deep came in under the Ben West and then the administration of David Briley, and they're the people that were kind of the architects Beverly. of doing the maps at the time. Beverly Briley. Excuse me. Yes. So. Different, different Mayor Briley. But this will date this map, basically. It's post-metro, so I think that gives it more weight considering it's not pre-metro, which the county it, was separate. It's difficult to read, but at the bottom right-hand corner, uh, that gibberish down there, you see E-10? Yes. Immediately to the left of that, uh, it's small on your copy and I apologize, but there's a signature of Charlie Raby. Tom and I knew him, but most of you are too young, I think. Uh, but uh, oh, when I started- it, it says, yeah, the, is it June 8th, 1961? Yeah, well, it's, it's actually, I think he signs it and says August 20th, 1963 was the date that he examined this map. So you can date the map at least from, from that time oh, from Charlie. Okay. Now, and again- Oh, down there, I see it. Okay. Yeah, and gotcha. the board would like a larger copy that's more legible. No, we, we could zoom, we could zoom. Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt, I just- I Oh, she- yeah. I'm sorry. She'll take a larger copy. I'll well, take one if you have one. Well, we, we've, we, we've given one to the uh, uh, to Emily, and we could probably put it up on the screen, perhaps. To okay, so Mr. White, the affidavits again. All right, the affidavits. Uh, if you'll go, these are pages five, six, and seven. Again, the key issue here is, was there a concrete batching plant on that property before 1974? That's the sole issue before this board today. Here's this affidavit. My name is Lewis Johnson, cites his residence. I've lived in this area all my life. I'm very familiar with the property, which is the subject of this hearing. As early as 1962, it was common knowledge that there was concrete manufacturing at the site where Smyrna Ready Mix is now located. I saw this operation, was aware that cement, sand, and gravel were mixed at the property, and there was a constant flow of concrete trucks to this site. I observed these activities myself from the mid-60s to 1970. To my knowledge, some of the products were sold up on Highway 12 in the form of steps for residential and commercial structures. In 1970 to 78, I was in the military but returned to Nashville and have been aware of concrete manufacturing operations on the site since I've returned. I'm also aware that W.L. Haley operated on this site with the same type of activity continued. This was during the 70s and 80s. I have no personal interest in the outcome of this matter. That's Mr. Lewis Johnson. The second one is Edward Pinnell. Uh, I'm 68 years old, gives his address, extremely familiar with the property, which over the year was known as Haley's Harbor. I was in this area on many occasions. I'm very familiar with the site. This would start with my preteen years and continue through my adult life. I was a concrete finisher all of my adult life. I'm familiar with the concrete business, including concrete batch plants. I was aware that during the mid 60s and early 70s, there was a concrete batching plant on this piece of property. I saw a red silo and frequently saw concrete trucks coming and going from the site as they went to Highway 12. I've never been employed by Smyrna Ready Mix. I have no personal interest in the outcome of the matter. Mr. Edward Pinnell. The third affidavit, Mr. Joey Hendren, uh, he had given a prior letter, uh, and this affidavit <coughs> clarifies that in paragraph five, very shortly after the purchase of the property of W.L. Haley, they brought in a concrete plant to pour and construct railroad ties, bracings, and bridge supports. They also allowed a company called Huddleston Concrete to use a concrete plant to pour forms for culvert ends and other various items. That's the third affidavit. All absolutely clear there was a concrete batching on plant on this operation long before the 74 date. Mr. White, can I ask you a question before I lose my 
train of yes. thought here. So these affidavits take you to there being that there was a concrete batching plant through the 80s. We, get, we got two that say that it was there in the 60s and 70s, one in the 80s. So explain to me your position that if, if, if the use ceases in the 80s, because the, the affidavits get you to the 80s, kind of take me on your analysis of the law, because earlier you said if you prove it was used before 1974, it sounds like you believe that's the issue, even if the, the use stopped or was abandoned. That is the issue, because basically what the Tennessee Code says is that uh, if you cease for 30 months, an argument can be made that basically it was amortized out. But what that section says, that 137208G4, quote, it only applies, this is the language, it only applies if the property owner intentionally and voluntarily abandoned the use. Intentionally involved and the burdens on the opponent to show that well, but if there's not a use there after 1980 I mean isn't it pretty why wouldn't that be intentional? I mean if you own the property and you're not operating a concrete batching plant there now That's a big difference. Excuse me big difference between that and intentionally and voluntarily Abandoning it and that's the very issue that Chancellor Bonneman decided in the case in front of this board on Charlotte and that is there had been an operation so, for so, uh, I'm and sorry. I explain that to me, I, and I, I'm not, I'm just trying to understand it, I, because if you own the property and you cease allowing a concrete batching plant to operate, it seems to me like that's an intentional abandonment. I mean, you're intentionally not operating the concrete plant, batching plant on your property. And the reason I think that's clearly not applicable is that under the statute, Tennessee's Non-Conforming Use Act is very broad about favoring them and saying that you can even discontinue and reconstruct. That's the language. You can discontinue and reconstruct. That's exactly what the folks did in this case. And when you talk about intentionally and knowingly abandoning it, my client bought from Haley Harbor. They bought it for the sole purpose of putting in a concrete batching plant. Uh, they certainly have had many discussions with them, and there's an affidavit from the person that was the harbor master for Haley's Harbor. Uh, that absolutely never knowingly and intentionally abandoned that. Okay, so you're saying if you discontinue it, I, I think I understand what you're saying. If you discontinue it, but then you you start that use again at some 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 period of time, whether it's three months, three years, or whatever, that 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 means you never really abandoned the, the use. Is that unless the opponent shows that they knowledgeably and knowingly abandoned it? Okay. So is is there a period of time that spans longer than 30 months that we're aware that no uh, concrete mixing took place on the site, and if so, when did that happen? I, I guess that's two questions. One is, is there a magic period of time after 30 months that you look at? And no, 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 I, I was asking, I mean, you, you, you've, I, I thought from John's um, memo that one of the, the main issues was uh, evidence that there was mixing prior to um, 1974. Th yeah, the, the, that date, which I don't think he had at that point, and, and you acknowledged when you uh, opened your remarks that, that you thought uh, his, what he had seen t up to that point uh, led to a correct decision. And so, if, I guess, I guess there's a couple of things there on my mind. One is, uh, if you're providing us a, with a lot of new information that, and I see these affidavits are dated uh, on Monday, uh, some are, you know, so it's, it is very fresh information um, that the zoning administrator may or may not have had a chance to analyze. Um, and according to your opening statement, it's 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 obvious and clear. Then why why not just get the zoning administrator to take a look at the new information and avoid uh, and avoid us altogether? Um, I mean, that, that's my primary question, but, the, but onto the 30-month uh, aspect of it, I guess I'm trying to, in my mind, build that timeline. If, uh, and again, not, not disputing the affidavits, but if the affidavits are uh, believed to be true and, and you establish it's been in use since 74, at what point do you know it was not in use? And does, and it, and does that period of time span longer than 30 months? And if it, because if, if you have evidence that that doesn't exist, then Ross's question is, you know, I mean, you're, you're talking about only the case of if it did happen. And I, I guess I don't have in my mind in that timeline where you had more than 30 months for us to even address that question. 
Well, let me answer what I think are two questions. The first one is with respect to the, <laughs> maybe more than that, but, but let me go at it like this to answer your question. The first one is submitting new information to the zoning administrator. The rules of this board have always been that uh, information in form that should be laying out your case are to be turned in by Monday of the week before. That's exactly what I've done for many, many years down here. That's what we did here. Nothing was filed in opposition. Nothing was filed right. to this point. Nothing was filed. With respect to the position uh, of John Michael, who is obviously a very capable uh, representative, I would like to uh, talk to the board for just a minute about that particular matter because when it came up, in fairness, we went back to the old harbor master. That was this Joey Hendren who ran the place for 15, 20 years. And we turned in a statement from him. I didn't talk to the gentleman. My client actually met with him and got that statement. But what's uh, important, I think, from that point forward is that if you look at the letter that was issued by John Michael, which went out to every lawyer in this case, and this is a letter that went out back, it says January 18 of 2018, he said it was 19. Uh, but what he concludes in it, we don't disagree about what the law is. I mean, the law is very simple. Was there a concrete batching plant at the site before 1974? He thinks it might have been a later date, 76 or whatever. I'm taking the earlier date of 1974. Every affidavit addressed that. But to answer your question, how, how John Michael concluded his opinion, he concludes by saying, if the concrete batch and mixing plant was legally in place at these two properties before the IR zoning designation took effect, then that could be confirmed as legally non-conforming under the existing zoning designation. So it's absolutely clear there's no dispute about the law. And although my client had basically gotten a letter from the old harbor master, uh, and that's what we turned in at the time, as we dug into it and saw there's no dispute about what the law is, can we show it was legally non-conforming and in use before 74? That was the source of the three affidavits. And we've got live witnesses here today also with respect to the operation. But we did exactly what your rules require. And my comment is, with respect to the zoning administrator, I've just said to you what the affidavits say. He's heard it and listened to it. He can tell you if that, you know, is on right. target or not. Well, with and we were already, I mean, we were, you, you had an opportunity to present the case here and, and I, get, I get that. It just, and, and again, it wasn't, it wasn't saying you, by any stretch that you didn't follow the rules exactly, but you always do a, a good job of that. And it, it really was, you know, it just sounded like to me, you know, the zoning administrator said, hey, based on what I know, I can't give it to you. You all went and found out, it, which you're presenting today, the, the information, which, like I said, had, had you had that originally, presumably we wouldn't be here because John, you know, and you didn't, I, that's, that's all. The other side might have come yeah. back. <laughs> but tell me about the timeline in terms right. of uh, if any period that you know about that where it was inactive. The only thing I can tell you without being very specific, I think in fairness, I have to say that uh, it probably was not in use for more than 30 months. I mean, it's very hard to go back and pin down all the time frames, but the Harbor Master talks about a concrete batching plant in the 80s, excuse me, the 70s, 80s, and maybe into the 90s. Uh, I but, think but it just goes to the 80s. Um, Is that, he, I saw it to the 80s. Did I miss that there was one that goes to the 90s? It may have gone to the end of the okay. 80s. But what I want to be candid with you to say is I, I don't know after Haley's Harbor uh, who operated there and what they did. I don't know that. So I want to say for purposes of discussion today, it may well have been more than 30 months that they didn't have a concrete batch plan. I don't know that. But the problem that the opponent has here is that the burden is on them to show that they intentionally and voluntarily abandoned it. That just doesn't mean you don't use it. Abandonment and not using it is too totally Mr. White, let me ask you something related to that. Um, you know, we've had boom and bust economies. Of course, right now, we probably can't make concrete quick enough. Um, in the 80s, we had a recession, and I remember doing some research on the Batman building, and people were jumping up and down in 1992 that we had a crane, one crane in our skyline. And obviously, if you have to look back at our skyline, TPAC opened in 1980, the old Third National Bank building in 1983. So, could you have a plan? Is this like idling a car plant that you have the plant, but there's just not demand, and then you kind of restart it when you get some big jobs? I mean, what, what did this look like? That was exactly the argument we used on the Charlotte Road case, which this board decided in our favor. It's the same argument here. But again, there's a total difference between not using something and then intentionally and voluntarily abandoning it. I mean, that would take someone coming before this board to basically come in and say, I owned the property. 
I basically decided I was gonna, instead of using a concrete batching plant, I was gonna turn this into a used car dealership. Somebody, there's gotta be some proof, not that they just quit using it, that's immaterial. The issue is, did they intentionally and voluntarily abandon it? And the issue is very clear under Tennessee law. The burden on showing that intentional and voluntary abandonment is on the opponents. That's not on my client, uh, period. But I, I'm presuming, to be <coughs> candid with the board, there may well have been a time after more than 30 months that there was not a concrete batching plant. I don't know that. We've tried to cobble together the very best history that we can, but I can say without any reservation that the burden's on the opponent to show that we intentionally and voluntarily abandoned it. And my current client certainly didn't buy it to make a used car lot out of it. They bought it to be a concrete batching plant relying on the history and the fact that it hadn't been abandoned. Uh, clearly, there's no evidence before you today you're going to hear from anybody that it was abandoned. All you're going to hear is that maybe it wasn't used for a period of time. Again, I respectfully submit that's not meaningful, and that's exactly what Chancellor Bonnyman said in that Richland Creek case. That's not meaningful unless the other side can show we intentionally and voluntarily <coughs> abandoned it. Was there any uh, batching equipment on the site, or what was the operation when you bought the property? My client would have to answer that. He is here. Uh, they negotiated for the purpose of putting a concrete batching plant. That is the principal use there on the site, um, and we've got some evidence of what was there when they came on board, but I, I need to ask my client that if that's permissible. So, Mr. White, you, in, in a, a different use of the property would be an abandonment, that you can see that, but, but you don't have, there's no evidence of that here. What you're saying is that what there's evidence is that the property just wasn't used as a concrete batching plant. I think that's accurate, Mr. Pepper. I think if someone said- Mr. White, please, the button, thank you. I'm sorry, if someone said that it looks like maybe there wasn't a concrete batching plan on the site for more than 30 months, I'm not in a position to deny that. I don't know that. Uh, and as Mr. Ewing said, you know, in the construction cycles right now, people that are doing concrete business are incredibly busy in Nashville. Sometimes they haven't been. Uh, but again, if the client had come in and basically sought a different use on the property. It's, it's now zoned IR. If they came in and said we want a different purpose on IR, I think that would be evidence of an intentional willful abandonment. That never happened here. No one ever sought uh, that type of change on the property. And so, again, I think the law is very clear. The burden is not on me to show that uh, anything didn't happen. The burden's on the opponents. So, again, it's so clear a difference between abandonment and not using it. I mean, you can have any number of circumstances in your life where you don't use something for a while. It doesn't mean you've abandoned it. You pick it back up. Well, I mean, th this, this, I can remember cases that we've had for legally non-conforming, you know, duplexes and triplexes and, you know, and the applicant, you know, you know, things, you know, homes were bought as a, as a triplex, but, you know, you had one person living in one apartment and not an ounce of effort to rent the others and it just you know they sat there and the meters had been kind of combined and you know maybe that was a sign of abandonment sometimes it's not and and you know i think that in, in some of those cases we said if you know if you didn't actively try to pursue your business and that was uh, a sign of abandonment and how is that different from your argument because basically uh the specific <coughs> law uh, and I don't know who argued different cases here. I know that we argued the Rich and the Creek case here. But when you look at the requirement that the burden's on the opponent to show willful and intentional uh, relinquishment of that right, and think about this, just the logic of this. My client buys the property from Hades Harbor for one principal purpose, a concrete batching plant. That's what they did out there. Uh, it's just incredulous that the owner would have thought, oh, I've intentionally and voluntarily abandoned it, but I'm gonna sell the property to somebody for that exact use. I mean, it makes absolutely no logical sense at all. My client wouldn't have bought it. They wouldn't have been able to sell it for that. Uh, so again, I, you can come up with any number of examples that you would like, but I can just say, at, at the risk of being repetitive and boring, there's a clear difference between not using something and abandoning it. You, you can put uh, a use and not particularly take care of it every day and never feel in your mind that you've abandoned it. So, uh, Mr. White, there was no evidence that you know of that back then of another use outside of concrete on this property? The, the concrete batching was the principal use on the site. It was one of the principal uses when Haley Harbor was there, and you can see that in the statement from Mr. Hendren. Uh, but you can also see 
since the critical thing is, was there concrete batching at the site before 74? I don't know how we could be any clearer than that than the affidavits we've turned in uh, from people in that age group who have identified year by year what took place. But again, I asked the board to consider that uh, with respect to an intentional and voluntary abandonment, I think it would probably been an act of, of deception and misrepresentation for Haley's Harbor to sell to my client, knowing they were gonna put in a concrete batching plan and say, oh, by the way, excuse me, we intentionally and voluntarily abandoned that. I mean, there's gotta be some evidence of that. And it's not just lack or cessation of use. Uh, that's what Chancellor Bonneman declared absolutely clearly in the Richland Creek case. So you're saying there's, there's published Tennessee authority from courts that, that the abandonment has to be intentional. I, I see where you cited ten, the Tennessee code for the, apparently it says that the burden of proving abandonment is on the government. And you're saying there's published, some kind of published case law where courts have said that the um, abandonment has to be intentional. Uh, the language in the statute is okay. intentional and voluntarily, and in the case and tried in front of Chancellor Bonneman, she cited that exact language. Okay, and said, so it's in, the, it's in the statute along with the burden being on the government. That's absolutely. what you're saying, okay. It's I, in the statute, tell it's from, in the case law. I understand. Decided right. by, the case didn't go to the Court of Appeals, but that was tried in our Chancery Court in front of uh, Chancellor Bonneman about two years ago. Uh, exact same issue, exact same issue, but it's, it, that language isn't my language, it's in the ordinance. Uh, the TCA section 137208G4, and it's clearly in Chancellor Bonneman's decision in that case that this Mr. board signed. Mr. White, why is this coming up now? How long has your client been on this property? This, this is what's interesting. My client has been out there uh, for, I guess, probably two years, uh, and, and I just want to be candid and say what happened was when the client came to us, and it has been, this has been an agonizing experience, I'm sure it is for the board as well, but and the client came to us almost three years ago to talk about putting in a concrete batching plant on this property. We sat down, Mr. Dean and I know a little bit about land use law, we may not be the most skilled, but we know something about it. And we talked to the client and said, you may well have a good argument for a non-conforming use on the site, but you can also seek a rezoning on the property uh, since right now under IR it's not allowed. Uh, and the client said, we've got a history of working with communities. We would really like to see if we can just get the zoning changed. They were gonna talk about an SP, a specific plan, that specifically would allow a concrete batching plant on the property, but disallow a lot of the bad IR uses. And what happened, here's the history in the district. We had five council members in, in three years. Uh, the first council member uh, <coughs> totally supported the proposal. We were moving forward with that. He got into some legal troubles. Uh, the first council person at large to pick up the district wasn't John Cooper, it was Sharon Hurt. And so we moved forward with a rezoning bill. Uh, the client went to untold meetings in the neighborhood. Uh, council Lady Hurt proposed the SP zoning, which would have allowed this on the site and was a placation to people that figured there might be other problems out there that are allowed under IR. In other words, basically, we will approve the concrete batching plant, but now all the other ab abrasive uses under you, that you can do under IR. We came here to the Planning Commission with that proposal. It was unanimously approved at the Planning Commission, not one dissenting vote. It came to the Metro Council, still under Sharon Hurt's watch, unanimously passed on first reading. It then came up for second reading, and by this time we were into Council Member 3, and he's, he's my contact and friend, capable lawyer, Nick Leonardo. He was the councilman at the time. Mr. Leonardo decided that he didn't feel there was community support for it. I'm not going to argue with him about it. We thought there was plenty of community support. Doesn't make any difference. He deferred the bill off the council agenda. <clears throat> any number of neighborhood meetings, to his credit, uh, Nick Leonardo was recognized as capable, was uh, basically appointed to the general sessions bench. So then we got to council member five, who was John Cooper, who testified here today, who said basically that in his six months of tenure there, we didn't approach him about the rezoning. To be candid, we had had all the fun we could stand by that point. We had been at it three years. We were into the fourth council person or the fifth by John Cooper. The client came back and we said, basically, here's what you can do. We looked at it. You don't need a building permit. Uh, the maps are here at the staff. And I just want to make the comment that the client did exactly what they were supposed to do. They got every permit required, the electrical permit from Metro government, they got the permit from the health department, they got a permit from the state, and they, <coughs> they built this plant out there. They built the plant, it took a year to build the plant. 
And then they were in operation for six months before anybody even knew the plant was out there. So that's how isolated this site is and where it is. You can see the industrial area all the way around it. That's not our legal argument. We're saying equitably and practically, they went the route to try to get this done correctly. I'm not faulting the community. I'm just saying the bill didn't pass uh, at the Metro <coughs> Courthouse. They came back, we started in. They initially gave us this letter from Mr. Hendren, who's the harbor master. <clears throat> and after we saw John Michael's opinion, which is correct, we looked at it and said, we really need to dig into this thing. And then we spent a ton of time looking at the Metro Clerk's Office, the archives, every other place to see what could be done. And we think it's our position is basically as tight as it gets. You can't be any more clear about what took place before 74. You can't be any clearer about there was never any tension or willful abandonment. Uh, but that's how we got here. Uh, and it's, it, maybe it's nobody's fault that nobody knew it was down there for 18 months, but it's in a big industrial area where it's probably the cleanest, neatest piece down there. But that's how we got to today. That's how we turned in the papers. We've had nothing but the best relationship with Nick Leonardo. I consider him a very capable lawyer. <coughs> and we saw nothing in opposition. The very thing we should be looking at about what was evidence about intentional and voluntarily abandoned. We've seen nothing. Um, but I'll, I'll call the next witness. I would like to ask Mr. Chairman if we could save three minutes for rebuttal. Sure, that's fine. So who else is here in the support of this that wants to speak? This is the time to come forward. Please identify, have a seat, press the button, turn on the microphone, and identify your name and address for the record. My name is Jimmy Lewis. I live at 4467 Pecan Valley Road and uh, lived there uh, almost 45 years. And before that, I grew up in Bordeaux and I went to Cumberland High School. And I guess back in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, I hunted all those bottoms down there and they were batching concrete then, I think basically for the Century Step Company, which uh, sold steps for re commercial and residential concrete steps. Um, I, like I say, grew up there in Bordeaux, and um, my dad had a five and 10 cent store there in one National City. And I can remember when National City Highway was two lanes and we'd get behind a concrete truck and uh, uh, I'd, <laughs> it wasn't so, a real good experience, but. Uh, so Mr. Lewis, you said you remember this in the 60s being a concrete, you've hunted over there, you've. I'd say the late 50s because uh, I hunted where Bordeaux Hills is now uh, was all fields. We hunted down behind the county hospital and then so, down in the bottoms down there where Haley's Harbor is. Okay. And, so, uh, Mr. Lewis, why are you here today in support of this? I, I don't have anything to gain or lose by it. Uh, I know the people, uh, the councilman there, uh, wanted to get up a busload of people and go up there and uh, uh, look at the plant, see what they thought about it. So. We got some people together. Uh, the group of ladies from Bordeaux came down and uh, nobody was in opposition of it other than a guy named Barry Sulkins, which he's notorious for going around causing <coughs> problems that don't concern him. So I know they've been good to the community. Matter of fact, uh, we've got a poor handicap rep at our part and snitching there. They're going to donate the concrete, and this group of ladies from Bordeaux said they had done quite a few things for them, helped them with sidewalks, other projects to improve a community. I know they're, they're big employers, and we went and toured the plant. Everything was ultra-modern. Sure. They wash their trucks down before they come out on the highway, and... Uh, Okay. I go back and forth to town every day, well, and I really don't see that, you know, okay. there's any kind of traffic problem or anything. It's well, four lanes and right off Briley Parkway. Sure. Okay, we appreciate you being here. Are there any questions for Mr. Lewis? Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. White. You say you have another witness to. I've got one witness last witness, support. and I'll I'll do it in the 50 seconds. What I'd like I, to I do. I have a question for Mr. Oh, White, yes, if I of can. Course. So you're relying on <coughs> TCA 13-7-208, which correct? And you're relying on the tolling provisions, Sir, essentially. Siri is trying to practice <laughs> law. I think we need to alert to, the board trying of law to take me somewhere. Uh, <laughs> because the way I read the tolling here is there's there's only there's only uh, four ways it can be told. And I don't. I'm not following your. I understand. I see this, the the part of the statute you're talking about where it says if the property owner intentionally and voluntarily <coughs> abandons the nonconformity, the nonconforming use of the property, then the restrictions do not apply. But it looks like to, for it to be told, there has to be a reactivation of the nonconforming use at any time prior to the end of the 30-month period, or there has to be an applicant a building permit filed or I'm going in reverse order on the statute. So I'm just trying. It's, it's obviously a complicated statute, and yeah, I'm looking at it now, and, me. and you guys have looked at it <laughs> we, we longer than it. I have. So the, I'm, I'm trying to take there, it, walk me through it because I, I don't see it. Just a quick uh, 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 historical background. Uh, what happened originally was there was no, in, in the original zoning ordinances, 20s through now, there were the original ones in the 20s and 30s. There was nothing about um, uh, uh, how do you deal with nonconforming uses. They, they tried to avoid it entirely, basically. Um, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, some cases came out and began to say that uh, in order to get rid of a nonconforming use, it had to be abandoned, it had to be an intent to, intentional abandonment. Um, uh, many of the local zoning ordinances picked that up. Comzo did in 1974, actually. Uh, uh, Tennessee General Assembly passed uh, 137208 and said, wait a minute, there's a, there's a tension between a, um, a mere discontinuation of the use, which is what uh, had been used by uh, some of the local ordinances, versus an intentional abandonment. And if you look at G4, that's the section that talks about this, the, the question is the G4, the 30 months, which is, a, which is just a discontinuation, you don't have to show uh, intentional abandonment. If it stops, then it stops for 30 months, then it's deemed abandoned. The problem is that then you go to G4, which one is actually works? Uh, uh, G4 talks about intentional abandonment, and up, up above it talks about uh, basically non-discontinuation, uh, not intentional abandonment. <coughs> Nobody really knows how the Supreme Court will look at it. The, the best judgment we've gotten is from the local trial courts here in Davidson County, including the one a couple of years ago from um, uh, Chancellor, Bonneman. Chancellor Bonneman, who basically said the 30 months doesn't apply under the statute that um, uh, it's got to be an intentional abandonment. Uh, now, again, Supreme Court might disagree with her, but that's, that's the best we can do. Mr. Dean, given you say that, why is our zoning administrator wrong then? What, why did he make a mistake in his? Oh, I, I, John was right in so far as looking at the um, evidence he had in front of him at the time, as Tom said. Okay. You mean prior to 1974? Right. In the 85s. R right. But specifically as to uh, our letter from John Michael, it, it says uh, it's fact specific and we have to show the use was in effect before the zoning change. Prior zoning allowed the use in question, and there's been no interruption used for 30 months. So he's not. So, well, you guys disagree yeah, on that I think, point? I, I think if that's the way John's letter reads, that that he's probably not as familiar with that case that comes from this board. I understand. <laughs> this, this board. What happened in that case, and some of you may recall, is that the property owner, uh, the person who was in control of that property, actually took bankruptcy, and it was idle for seven to ten years. Uh, uh, we came in with with documents dem demonstrating that the owner had never intentionally abandoned. Board agreed with us, uh, notwithstanding the bankruptcy of a, a former lessee. And, and said that the nonconforming use should be retained. When on appeal, the neighbors appealed that. And Chancellor Bonneman uh, uh, reached that issue and said, basically, you've got to show intentional ab abandonment under G4. Uh, and having not been able to do that, um, uh, the board's decision was upheld by the chancellor. So you think those cases are very similar? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because there was no intentional abandonment. Abandonment of the use. Even though there was a longer period where right. it wasn't selling cars or whatever, right, use cars. Right. 
because the, the, the problem is always, if it's less than 30 months, then it's clear that, you know, uh, you but just that's use not that the, But that's not the whole test. Like you said, it's willful, and right. intentional right. abandonment. Right, right. But, but again, if, if, once you get beyond that, and that was clearly presented in the, the that case from two years ago, and I'm sorry, I can never remember the name of the case, but uh, uh, one of the interesting things about the case and why it stands out in my mind, and, you, you know, I, I may have a more academic interest in some of these things, um, uh, there's always been that question, what in the heck did the Tennessee General Assembly do under 137208? Because they've got, they, it's almost like they put two elements of disparate uh, decision making into the same statute. And actually, I've talked, Jim Murphy was actually on the floor at the General Assembly when it happened and said, George, they rushed it through at the last minute. Nobody really knows what they were intending to do. Uh, so we're just make, we're trying to do the best job we can at interpreting the, the statute. Um, uh, uh, it's it's a, a complicated statute, as, as uh, Mr. Pepper said. And uh, uh, Again, the best guidance we have now is from uh, uh, the chancellor. So in your mind, willful abandonment would include like a totally different use or just a new entity on that site, replacing the old? From, from my standpoint, it would be something that would be have to be inconsistent with the uh, the former use. Uh, I can see situations where if you've got uh, a gasoline service station, you shut down the service station and do something else for a while, doesn't mean that the owner is not intending maybe to come back the, to the pumps are station. still there yes the tanks are in the ground right, things like that know, it's so even even if you don't have any ounce of effort to use your property as it's now non-conforming use you're saying that that's the the 30 month clock shouldn't be ticking right um, and and by the way mr taylor on your previous I mean, question about residential uses that doesn't fall under 137208. Only applies to industrial and commercial. Okay. On residential, it's your it's just the local ordinance that bind. That so that so you don't you don't have to have a, a sales force in place, an advertisement, uh, anything that says, Nothing. you know, if if the economy is the reason that you're out for 30 months, there's you know you don't have to show an ounce of effort that you're trying. You just have to leave it be. And so if, if in this argument they could leave it be for 50 years and come back and start it right up again. Well, I'm not sure about that, but in fact... Well, I mean, how, how, how long is it? Because it's, it's been right a while, now you're saying sure. it's more than 30 months. But, but, but and, again... And your, and your case was seven years. Yeah. Again, so for, what, is the, what is the outside limit? Yeah, well, I, I don't know that. I, I don't know the answer to that question. But I, I would say, again, there was no sales staff for the, the, the dealership mean, on the, the uh, property on Charlotte that we were talking about. Uh, they, in fact, took bankruptcy. They, they were not operational out there for a long, long time. And the, the explanation from them was that the, uh, the, the market had gone down and they, they just weren't able to uh, make sales. So, so I think, um, so the, the argument is, and as you pointed out with Mr. Taylor, it's very different from a residential use because you have your neighbors and your community that's more adversely or differently affected. <laughs> So you're saying you could have a non-conforming use, you can shelve it, you can have a conforming use on a piece of property, and at some point undetermined in the future, as long as you've not, I'm going to say, taken out your infrastructure or done something indicating you're not going back to that use, you can go back to the non-conforming use. Yes, <coughs> Freely, with no... No asking anybody, it's your property, you once had the non-conforming use and you keep it forever as long as you go back to the same non-conforming use. Now, now, ordinarily you probably go for a permit, you don't probably don't, you normally get a permit. Uh, 13708, 13-7-208 allows for the issuance of the permit uh, based on the non-conformity. Uh, in this particular case though, because the building permit wasn't required, we just mm -hmm. got the So. I asked earlier, what, what what was the activity of the property when it was bought, or if anything? I'd, li I'd like to ask the client who just asked me to be able to answer that. You know, the primary products, concrete is obviously rock and sand, and that, when we bought that, that's what they were unloading with barges. So there's river access on this property, and, you know, and when we bought the property, there was there was old concrete plant components on the on the piece. So when we bought it with like what kind of components? Uh, belts and bins, um, and even a, a mixer, uh, central mixer drum. 
that we use to manufacture. So that was as far as you could tell the last use on that property was? Yes, but th those were just components. I mean, they weren't in place. And, and, you know, a lot of our components go hand in hand for the use that was there and what's, uh, and, and, and concrete plants. So the belts, I can use them for other, other, you know, other so things. So you actually use some of this? These items, when you first took over, you were able to use some absolutely, of them? yeah, the Work. belts and rollers, and I, you know, because I'm stacking different raw materials off the river, you know, okay. sand and rock, coal, salt. So that's consistent with the prior use, and like you said, this was left on the property. Yeah, I, th and there was a there was a marine operation when we bought it. They were unloading barges there when we purchased the property, and we continued that operation throughout this entire process. And now we use that operation to feed, uh, you know, the, our concrete plant that we have on site. We we bought that because it was a uh, one-stop shop, you could say, for for rock and sand, where I don't have to dump truck materials so you had into road, a plant. You had water. Did you have rail nearby too? R rail is there, but I don't use rail. Mm -hmm. But rail is on the property. Okay. If, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you could please say your name and address. I'm sorry. I'm Jeff Hollingshead, and I'm at 1136 Second Avenue North. It's our principal office. Um, Mr. White, you have one other person you want to speak, and you want to do. save three minutes for. Right. This will be very short. Next witness is Mr. Don Yancey. Thank you, Jim. And in preparation, I'd like to hand to the staff the resume. Uh, this gentleman is with Middle Tennessee Testing Company. He's been involved in soil and concrete uh, testing for 30 years. Mr. Don Yancey. Please identify yourself for the record and address and uh, while you're here. Yeah, I'm Don Yancey, 221 Valley Drive. I'm with Middle Tennessee Testing Company. Um, and he's handing out my resume to you guys right now. But why are you here? What are, what are you adding? I was uh, called to go out to the Smyrna Ready Mix site on Amy Lynn Drive and observe where the core samples, uh, concrete core samples, were cored in diode assisting foundations. And uh, the core sample confirms that the concrete sample dates from the 1950s, possibly early 50s to mid 60s when it was poured, or early 60s. Uh, it has river gravel in it, the big river gravel that. Uh, was not used out in the early 70s due to limestone, crust limestone becoming so so plentitive and cheap to manufacture structural concrete. So how, how do you how do you determine that it was in the 50s? You said but besides the river gravel. Uh, actually, what you do is you take the uh, cement and you do an acid bath on it, and you take the weights of the acid bath, and it had little to no fly ash in it, and that's also an indication when fly ash didn't come around into structural concrete for many years. Um, the um, okay. Any any other questions for the? No, so, but but your, it, your your testimony is your professional opinion is that that it was it, it had been that the the infrastructure to process or mix concrete was there at least in the 50s. That's that's correct. Okay. It was manufactured and poured to make the foundation for the batch plant in the early to mid 50s, possibly as early as the, as late as the early 60s. Okay. Any, any other questions? So you'll have three minutes left for rebuttal. Mr. Chairman, I did want to clarify. I was asked a question by one of the members about a 30 month period of time. Yes. And I said, I want to be candid. Um, I don't know it was longer than 30 months. I don't know what took place with respect to a concrete batching total operation after Haley's Harbor left. I just know what my client just testified to, that a lot of the components were still actively being used. I couldn't find the name of an active concrete batching uh, company during those periods of time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our, our computer and Metro logo is upside down. I'm not sure what to make of that. The Metro seal sad that Mr. Harper and I are leaving. Yeah. It's just things are being turned on their heads. <coughs> Mr. Leonardo, welcome to the BZA. Please identify yourself for my name, address, and what brings you here. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Nick Leonardo, um, and my address is 603 Woodland Street, Nashville 37206. Um, I represent uh, the uh, Bells Bend uh, Beeman Park Conservation Corridor, which is a 501 uh, C3. 
Uh, but I, I definitely wanted to start off by thanking each one of you for your service. Uh, I, this is a, a big commitment that each one of you make, and we need people like yourselves to continue to do this so that we can have you know, the, the correct outcomes. I also wanted to say, too, before I begin, that, um, that here is uh, Sarah uh, Trunzo, who is the staff representative uh, for the organization, the 501c3 that I represent. Um, and I've actually had an opportunity as the councilman, I've talked to Mr. Holland's head. Uh, we've actually spent um, about half a day riding around looking at his operation a couple of years ago. Uh, nice gentleman, this is not, nothing to do with him. And of course, as Mr. White says, uh, he and I do have a good relationship and he's a good lawyer. And I think he and Mr. Dean have probably forgotten a whole lot more about land use than I'll ever know uh, at this point. Um, but, you know, looking and talking about the law of vested rights, and that looks apparently, though, that's something that may have been abandoned, but are the grandfathering statute. I mean, this stuff is riveting information, and it's a cure for insomnia. And I think that, uh, you know, I do believe John Michael could agree with that as well. But what I'd like to do is, from a different angle, uh, and it's been touched on just a little bit, I would like to uh, start off with a little bit of the procedural history here. I mean, everybody who can afford it wants the best lawyer that you can get. And I think you live and die by the good lawyer. And in this situation, uh, Mr. Holland has, has two fine lawyers. And back in 2016, they filed a, um, a piece of legislation to get a rezoning so that they can be compliant with what they're wanting to do on the property. Um, and obviously that went through the council system. And when I got elected after Mr. Green um, passed on and, and had legal troubles, um, I had a meeting with 200 people from the community at the Cathedral of Praise. I believe that Mr. Hollingshead was there. I asked by show of hands who supported the project. Not one single hand went up. Uh, and so I deferred that legislation indefinitely. But prior to doing that, I would say there's been at least 10 to, to 20 meetings that Mr. White, Roy Dale, Mr. Hollingshead has been to, uh, spending th willing to spend thousands of dollars with community benefit agreements and all of these things that they're willing to give the community if they would just get some support for the rezoning. Um, if this was something that was so simple and they're grandfathered in, why in the world did they spend thousands of dollars in a few years trying to get a rezoning? Their lawyers knew about this grandfathering issue <laughs> the first day that they walked into their office. They did not begin, uh, they did not erect this equipment uh, until uh, I got appointed as the one of the domestic violence judges in General Sessions Court uh, back in January of um, last year, and at that point in time, uh, there was no elected representative in District 1, and uh, the vice mayor appointed John Cooper. John Cooper came and spoke today because he was aware of, of the zoning legislation, but him as the interim council member was never even contacted about what the plans were, were they grandfathered, or were there, wh whether there was um, actually uh, equipment. And so when they first bought this place, when I was there, um, they, they were taking materials off of the waterways and driving them to the foot of Jefferson Street to mix concrete. Um, obviously, we know that uh, gas is expensive in triaxle dump trucks, and so if they could have moved this equipment, this huge piece of equipment there, to where they could actually manufacture concrete on, on a much larger level, that would save them uh, considerable amounts of money. And so there's a reason why it's not a requirement to be a lawyer on the Board of Zoning Appeals, because we, we also need some common sense non-lawyer perspectives. And in this situation, when you spend thousands of dollars trying to get a rezoning, achieve a rezoning, and then it gets deferred indefinitely in that process and you don't like how that works out, then we'll just take the other legal alternative thousands of dollars later. Well, obviously that's a very dangerous proposition because it, it eclipses the voice of the people in that district and their elected representatives that did not have support for this. And if this was really the way, if they really believed that they were grandfathered in, why not go that way from the, to begin with? Why even mess with the council? Why even mess with, with anybody like that, right? Because this is the backup plan. And so if you don't get your way with zoning in industrial areas and minority communities, then the backup plan is that we'll just turn right around and we'll go this route and we'll say that uh, this is something that uh, we were grandfathered in. Now, as it pertains to, to speaking of being grandfathered in, I, I do differ a little bit with Mr. White. I mean, I, Mr. White is correct when he says that if they can prove, if they can prove the existence of this concrete batch plant, uh, then the burden would shift for us to prove that there was some sort of abandonment. Well, 
I don't know that we've been able to prove or that they've been able to prove, and of course it's not up to me, but I would submit that they have not been able to prove the elements that needed to be shown uh, according to John Michael's letter, which I think is correct, that the effect was in the use before the zoning change. The prior zoning allowed the use in question. There had been no interruption of the use for a period of 30 months or more since the change in the zoning designation. Um, all we have are affidavits uh, that do not address the 30-month period uh, necessarily whatsoever. And I do think that there's a big difference in um, taking stuff off of a barge and maybe you got a bucket and you mix up some concrete. That's much different to a, a six-story, multi-million dollar thing that generates lots of trucks, additional truck traffic and the other issues that are associated with building something on this grand scale. Um, so the question becomes today, are the affidavits, and there's a reason for you lawyers, and you know it, why we don't use affidavits all the time. Not subject to cross-examination, uh, absent a, a TRO or uh, some verified petition, it's just not something that we really use much in the law. Um, and again, even if you look at the affidavits, they think that they may have been some concrete usage going on, but I don't think that we get to the point or that it rises to the point that there's actually, that they've shown uh, that there has been this use, the same use, not mixing concrete in a bucket. This is a huge operation, okay? This is, and, it, and, it, and he's correct that it is a, uh, it's equipment, okay? And a lot of times equipment is ancillary to a principal use. You see it a lot of times with trucks. Somebody wants to move their office somewhere, trucks become their uh, equipment and ancillary to the use. And then a lot of times, my experience as the councilman has been that someone would call you and say, councilman, do we gotta get a change in zoning or do you stipulate that this is equipment ancillary to the use? The other thing, uh, and that did not happen here. John Cooper never got any notice. The other thing is that they have this electrical permit that they were also uh, going under. But again, electrical permits and trade permits aren't subject to review by codes and planning. Okay, so this is just simply, I would submit a backdoor way to put industrial development wherever you would like it to be. And based upon the past history of this case, the grandfathering issue, the vested rights issue, that never came up until the bill got deferred indefinitely. Furthermore, this thing was not built until there was no elected councilman in District 1. And this came up last year, and first time I heard about it was somebody accused me of somehow being affiliated with it when I was uh, in the judicial campaign because it's built, and, and now they see it, and they're thinking that somehow I had something to do with it, and I said, go back and pull the tapes. We deferred the legislation indefinitely. So I don't know that they have proven by just grabbing people out of the community uh, and having these affidavits exactly what it is that they need to prove under this particular statute to show that they were grandfathered in. Um, you know, the other, the other day I was, I was flipping through the channels and I, and I saw um, A Time to Kill. I think we've all seen that. And then Matthew McConaughey gives this closing argument at the end, this impassioned closing argument about Carly Haley and he has the jurors to close their eyes and, you know, then he says, well, what if she was white? Well, when I saw that, I thought, okay, if you close your eyes and you think, okay, they try to get a rezoning, the community's against them, they try to do everything they could to, to help, you know, give community benefit agreements and, and to give all the neighborhood associations thousands of dollars, but no one was for it. And then they come and they build it anyway when there's no elected official. Well, what if it was Green Hills? What if it was Richland West End? This wouldn't have happened. This is a Bordeaux-centric, District 1 kind of issue that does occur out our way, and that's how the landfill out there has gotten out of control. I mean, I passed the Jackson Law. Hopefully, it'll keep that at bay, and we won't have any new landfills in Davidson County. But again... But, uh, but wait a minute. I grew up in Bordeaux. This was out here in the 50s before Bordeaux became the black middle-class neighborhood that we know today. You cannot put this on, we were putting this out in the black neighborhood. They were doing this kind of work long before my family moved out there in the early 70s. Well, I'm comparing it to the fact that we wouldn't see this, Mr. Chairman, in other parts of town. There's a lot of things that we see with land use and development. But this happened in the 50s when the area was totally rural and did not, was not the Black West meat. So that's a different kind of argument. I'm not even sure why you're- No, no, I'm talking argument. about they made the, I'm talking about the erection of the equipment last year without a change in zoning, without any conversation, that is what I'm talking about. But the use goes back decades, over 50 years. Well, if that's, if you buy that 
position or that argument that there has been this concrete we heard batch plant. Jimmy Lewis today. He lived out there. He hunted out there. Are you saying he was wrong? Well, I'm not calling any of these folks a liar. I'm just saying, do well, yeah, uh, but you does impugn it, the people that submitted affidavits? What about Mr. Lewis who was here that we asked questions to? Well, I wasn't. I don't know that it still addressed the 30 months period, though. I mean, I, you know, that's the other thing. Is it has it addressed that part? I think of, Mr. White is conceding, though, that it, there may have been an, the use may have stopped for more than 30, 30 months. He's he's conceding that he's not he has not uh, made that argument. He's just saying even if it did under the statute, and I appreciate what you have to say about the council and the rezoning, but our, our job here is so limited. This is an item A appeal, and we're just supposed to review the law and determine whether the zoning administrator erred or not. And, and Mr. White's conceding the 30 months. He's just saying it doesn't matter because the statute says, and I, they're they're correct in their reading of the statute. I'm not sure what how some of these words should be interpreted. And I understand, you know, Chancellor Bonnyman has apparently made some kind of interpretation. But what he's saying is that you'd have to prove that even if they didn't use the property for 30 months, you'd still have to prove that their non-use was an intentional and voluntarily, they intentionally and voluntary, voluntarily abandoned it, and that just not using it is not intentionally and voluntary, voluntarily abandoning it. That's what, what Mr. Dean and Mr. White are saying. Well, and, and, and I guess the question becomes is, if you take materials off the water and you may not be a concrete bash plant. Let's say that you make a bucket of concrete or you have a small, uh, um, in addition to all of the other things that you do on this particular piece of property over the years, um, is that the same use as a concrete batch plant, a place where concrete is manufactured uh, at a very, very high level and that's the sole purpose of the property? And I don't know that making something smaller is that was the sole use of the property I and mean, I just don't know that we have enough to know that that is there was a concrete batch plant well, I don't I think I think that I think we have that evidence but I think we don't have after 1990 at the latest or 1989 there's no evidence that there was any use and so my question is you know is that if you don't use it from 1990 to 2019 is that an intentional involuntary, do you, have you intentionally and voluntarily abandoned it? It's, I mean, if you're not there for 19 years, that's a, a pretty good amount of time. Um, so um, anyway, that's, I, maybe that's helpful to you about what, where you're going. Well, and I, and I don't know if, as a whole, we don't know what was going on there, quite frankly, during that period of time. And that would, and it is difficult to go back and show that, okay. according to, to their law and their position on it, that, that this more than, I guess, more than an overt act. To some degree, there's got to be some, you know, intentional abandonment. But again, I don't know that that's a hole that we don't have as to what exactly was going on on that particular property. But we do know that there was not a concrete batch plant on this property when it was purchased, obviously, by Smyrna ReadyMix. And I think that was the entire goal, was to, at some point, get a concrete batch plant there. But it was still an attractive purchase for the applicant um, and their business by being able to take materials off of the river and to take them to another place and mix them. But you're exactly right. I mean, they're not 20 years. I don't know that we have anything. So, Mr. Leonardo, you said you don't know what was going on during the 90s um, at that site. Mr. White said about four or five times, it's your burden to tell us. Well, if the, I guess it is, I'm sorry, let me interrupt you. No, it's your burden to prove that, you know, this wasn't, this was being abandoned, willfully abandoned. And so what's, what's the proof? Well, I mean, this is something that I have received on Monday about the fact that they now have affidavits. This was not in the original, this has been going on for about six months back and forth. We've been writing letters. And so this was something new. And I just wasn't sure if the, if the uh, board was going to find and that there was indeed, based upon those affidavits, concrete manufacturing going on on the property. And if it does shift to us, then we don't have something to show that there was a, an abandonment at this, at this point. Because that's, like I said, it was Monday we saw the affidavits that 
Well, that's when they're supposed to be turned into the board, and you got a copy, right? No, I got a copy. I'm not disputing that, but there was also a prior letter months later that didn't have any of that stuff in there, you know? So, I mean, it's it's one of those things, and I've been in a couple of trials this week as well, but it, again, it's one of those issues that if you had those affidavits and you had that proof, why wasn't that submitted in the prior letters from months back? Well, and <clears throat> I'm not even sure. Did you even know? It seems like the, the argument kind of, and I'm not, not it wasn't intentionally uh, trying to fool y'all or anything, but it just seemed like that the zoning administrator took a position and Mr. White did what he was supposed to do, which was go get, look, look deeper into the statute, get these affidavits, and then y'all didn't know he was going in that direction until Monday. Correct. And now you have, I, I, they're right, I, is in my reading of the statute, the government has the burden of proving an overt act of abandonment. And are you, is it fair to say you didn't know you had that burden until Monday? Exactly. Yes, sir. Absolutely. 100%. I didn't realize that those affidavits were in the offing. And it's nothing. I mean, that's just the lawyer on the other side, and that's fine. But I didn't. The prior correspondence had a letter from the harbor master, and I addressed the letter from the harbor master and set out why we believe that it wasn't, you know, that there was no proof in that letter that concrete, you know, batch plant was going on in Haley's Harbor at that time. And then Monday, um, with those affidavits, and obviously, if you do believe those affidavits uh, set forth what it needs to set forth, then the burden would shift, and, th and I don't have any proof that I can submit that there has been an abandonment. Now, that's a more difficult issue, and it takes more time, but that's correct. I, I don't have anything to show that it was abandoned other than there's lots of holes and periods of time. Um, and I don't know that it says that there's concrete batch going on. Con they saw concrete on the property or concrete was, some of them even say, I believed that concrete. I think we have Mr. Lewis's testimony, who was a firsthand, uh, who stated that he saw, all right, and I think one other says that they saw, but the other two affidavits sort of suggest that they were aware that concrete was being made on that particular property. Um, and so, but again, I still think that it's one of the issues that if this was always the case, then, then why all the, the work about the rezoning and, and all of those things? I mean, I, I think this is kind of the backup position. But the issue about the rezoning has nothing to do with our item A appeal. We're trying to decide whether the zoning administrator erred or not. Their process, whether through the council or us, that's irrelevant. We're just trying to see whether John Michael and his four-page letter was right or wrong. And he doesn't get into that whether it went to the council or not. Well, and I, but I think it's instructive as to whether or not that was actually going on on the property. I mean, I, I, I mean, I really do. If, if this was deferred, would you use that time to go, or are you saying you would, you would probably use that time to go try to find witnesses who would submit affidavits that would contest the affidavits that have been submitted that would well, say Well, absolutely. No I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm sure I could find two or three and, witnesses that would contest that issue, sure. Okay. And, and you didn't, you didn't have any idea you would be confronted with those affidavits until Monday of this That's week? That's correct, and I did receive them on Monday afternoon, yes, sir. But on, on the other hand, too, though, the, because some of these things, as we, we, I think this board recognized, you know, were dated uh, after the zoning administrator's uh, letter, the zoning administrator hadn't had a chance to look at some of this, I, I don't believe, in detail, is that correct? And so... It, it may be that based on the evidence that is presented, yes. the zoning administrator could yeah. well, let me ask the zoning alleviate admin. his concerns yeah. and issue a permit or John, John say Michael, it's okay. we've, we've had these cases before where new information came forward and then the BZA had a case and most of the time, whether it be you or Bill Herbert, you're like, I wrote my letter based on what I knew then, you all get to decide. And what is your take on this? That's exactly the situation still, as has always been the case. We make the determination that we make based upon the documentation, the evidence, and all the information available to us leading up to the date of the letter that's been received. It's completely appropriate for either party to find and provide more evidence, more documentation in the intervening period leading up to the BZA hearing. Um, and the board does get the ability to make the determination. It but isn't that the point of an item A appeal? If you quote unquote don't get it right, we get to determine whether you did or not. Uh, that's yeah. essentially the request on an item A, I suppose. But I guess to me that the, the, the main difference is, you know, the, the side that's appealing the decision I think, if I remember it right, said he got it right based on what he was given. And so 
it's not, uh, you know, the, the letter that determined um, that this was not appropriate based on uh, its history and or the evidence of the history. I think they all said this is correct and we're going to provide new evidence to, to prove him wrong through new evidence. And so, you know, it's a, it's a little more than just simply saying, hey, did he get it right or not? But because it's... Well, to me, the affidavits go back to the 50s and 60s, which don't seem to be in dispute here. So well, I agree with that. I mean, I guess... I'm not sure, given him more time, what he would come up with, someone saying, oh, in the 60s, they weren't doing this. Well, we're really not arguing about... I think most of us agree, including... Um, Mr. Leonardo, that this this use was going on during that period. Well, I don't want to concede that, but well, but you the, said well, something to basically to that extent. In, in this, you in know, the, about ten minutes ago. And well, this, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Well, I mean, this may be more in in, in discussion, but um, but I was thinking it uh, at the other way is that if this is compelling new evidence, uh, it may be the board may want the zoning administrator to to analyze it with the zoning staff to determine if it's adequate. I mean, we have done that before with, yeah. with many cases where we've said, you know what, let's just send it back to the zoning uh, st staff to take a look at, and and you may need, not need to come to our board because, or, or. John Michael, would more information be helpful for you in this particular case? More information is usually helpful in most cases. Well, David, you, you articulated something I wasn't <coughs> able to articulate, which is at the time that John Michael, the zoning administrator, wrote the letter, I, he did not err. And, and Mr. White is saying that. And Mr. White did what a good advocate would do, which is came forward with more evidence. But I think procedurally it puts us in a posture where we're, we're, we're kind of going somewhere where, I mean, our, 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 we need to decide did the administrator make the right decision based on the evidence he had. <laughs> I, I, that's the way I see it. Well, I mean, there are there are many cases that we've we've said, no, it, it's clear, and and even uh, I, I don't know if it was the current zoning administrator, but in in the past we've we've had no objection from the zoning administrator based on the new information because it was universally agreed that it was uh, it was correct and it was something that wasn't available, and so. In those cases, I think it's perfectly appropriate for us to to make a decision, and and we may feel that way here. But I think if we feel like that it's still uh, gray, or we really want someone to spend more time on it than than we have to actually look at the documents, maybe with a little uh, clearer eye, then I think that's where it's appropriate to to defer it and say, hey, you know, let's let's have the staff look at it again and. And the, and, and the zoning administrator may come back and say, no, it's still not appropriate, in which case we, you know, we have a, a, a kind of a deeper level of thought, maybe another response, that kind of thing. I don't know. I think it's, again, that may be part of the discussion, but I don't, I don't think it's inappropriate for us to decide it if we feel like we should, but I don't think it's inappropriate to defer it if, if we feel like that's the best course, too. I think, I think the appellant would obviously need to have input on whether we defer or not. I mean, in, in a, the way I feel about this is that, you know, especially on item A, it could, you, one could perpetually bounce it back and forth before it ever comes to us. Uh, you know, the appellant, potential appellant could say, I think you aired, here's some evidence, why don't you look at this before you send it for the appeal and maybe you'll change your mind. And, and then here's the some more you know, evidence. Here's, here's some, some more evidence. evidence. So, yeah. and so, I mean, how long do we wait till everybody concedes? We've gotten all the evidence we can possibly give. Please, BZA, give us a decision. I mean, th the facts that have been presented haven't really been disputed yet. And both sides are represented by counsel too. I mean, it's their job I, to kind yeah. of do this. And, and, and it's not, not a small fact, but I mean, it's talk about being short timed. I mean, I'm really not gonna look at this case after we make a decision. So two more people are gonna to have to review this or the remaining five of you will have to decide on a five person vote. So I, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I guess I'm saying I don't we see We are on this board it. until our uh, duly appointed representative from the mayor's office is confirmed by the Metro Council. Maybe, so you're stuck maybe here. you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the board does decide, I mean, I would, have countervailing affidavits and do my best to find that evidence. But if that's not a proper thing, then I understand the board makes its decision. So 
Um, Miss Lamb, okay, put you on the spot here. Um, we've, we, we're having a hearing, of course. We've heard from both sides, not completely. Is this something that would be helpful to have more information, or is this board ready to, based on what's in front of us, to determine whether John Michael aired or not? Well, I think, as Mr. Michael said, more information perhaps is always better. I think ultimately it's the board's decision. If you all feel like you have heard um, and received everything that's pertinent enough for you to make the decision whether or not the zoning administrator aired. And, and one thing that can has, that one option that this board has done in the past is to say the zoning administrator aired based on the information presented to him at the time. Mm -hmm. We now have new information, therefore he got it wrong based on this new information. Um, but ultimately, Ultimately, it's up to the board to determine, you know, the affidavits were submitted by the deadline on Monday, um, and do you want to give the opposing side an opportunity to provide competing affidavits? Do you want to make it based on the, dis the information that you have currently? So to answer your question, I think that that's really up to the board. Okay, so I think what was best to do, we will let Mr. Leonardo to finish your case. We'll hear from Mr. White about, you know, this. Uh, recent interest of possibly deferring this okay so continue so well th that's all that I have at this point I mean I would ask that if the board does see fit to give us another week or, or, or de gets postponed or deferred until the next meeting agenda then I can assure you I'll do everything that I can to have countervailing affidavits or what proof that I could find that there affidavits was. based on what so you would go find people that say this wasn't a plant in the 50s and 60s yes sir Yes, sir. Okay. That's the goal. That's the goal. Okay. So let me ask you about this. We were talking about the 90s and 2000. You know, you obviously knew that that would come up today, but you, do you have any affidavits or information about the use prior to Smyrna Ready Mix being here? No, I do not. Not. Did you look for some? Did you go out and try to research this? No, I mean, I looked at, you know, past deeds and the like and um, didn't find that, it, you know, that it was owned, but it's hard to find what corporation had their principal place of business. You look at the Secretary of State when you find a deed and then it may not be actually off of Amy Lynn Drive. So it's been difficult, but I do know that there are people that are there in that community that have lived there for a long time. And I may go talk to them and find that they say, well, maybe it was going on, but then I may talk to them and there may be some that say, you know, I don't believe it was ever that I was aware a concrete batch plant. Do you, do you have any um, argument today on the uh, appellant's um, interpretation of the grandfather clause and the concept of intentional abandonment. Are, are, I'm going to ask our legal folks and zoning administrator that too and at some point. But that that seems to be that seems to be their response to how we should approach the 30-month window. And the other outstanding piece was the uh, the date at which this started. And so we've talked about the date of which it started, but I want to know your thoughts on this 30-month window uh, and, and how they presented uh, the way they interpret Tennessee law. Well, I mean, I would agree with Mr. Dean that we don't have any um, appellate court you know, opinions on this interpretation. And I, have, I am familiar with the Richland Creek watershed case. That seems to be one that actually uh, uh, Mayor Briley uh, was representing the, the appellate in that particular case. Um, but as far as the interruption or use of service for 30 months, I mean, this becomes a very, very fact-specific issue as to whether or not there was an interruption uh, during that period of time. Um, this was really the first here recently that I had heard that there had actually been an, uh, that the allegations seemed to be having proof and being verified that there actually was um, concrete bash plant going on, but when it comes to whether or not that has been abandoned, 
um, then I think you have to look at the facts. And of course, it, you know, does it is it a question as it was put on a shelf and it was never used and it just sat around and someone else came back in? Um, but I do think that they would have to show that there's an actual operational status in the chain of title uh, that you know had been going on. Uh, so I don't know that there's actually any real definitive answer on that 30 month, but I think that we can show that there definitely was not periods of non-use. And what do those periods of non-use look like? And what actions were taken during those periods of non-use? And what else was being conducted on the property? I mean, that whole area is, you know, somewhat um, complicated area. Any other questions for the opposition? Okay. Anything else to add? Uh, no, sir. Okay, we're going to hear from Mr. White, and we'll determine All right, thank whether you. we're going to rule today. Mr. White, you'll have three minutes left for rebuttal, and we'll, of course, ask you whether what is your opinion on this request for deferral, more information, et cetera. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to be very clear in our position. There is no basis to defer this matter, and I want to be very clear. We played by the rules. We do exactly what the rules are required. Papers are to be turned on Monday. We've done that for many, many years down here. That's exactly what we did. When these papers were filed on Monday, we made sure a copy went immediately to Mr. Leonardo. I called him that very day and said, here's the papers. Got any questions? You want to call me? I never heard anything until today. He's, he's a good professional. I didn't hear one thing about it. I also want to make this comment, just for whatever it's worth, for the comment that's made that nobody was for this when it came to the council is somewhat irrelevant, but it's absolutely not true. Sharon Hurt was down here, and it was unanimous approval at the Planning Commission. I mean, there were a bunch of people lined up here in this room in the Planning Commission that supported this. At some point, that may not have been Nick's read of it, but don't say nobody was for this thing. It was unanimously approved here and passed unanimously at first reading at the council. With respect to the affidavits and about their some amorphous language, there's nothing amorphous about these affidavits at all. I have lived in the area of my life as early as 62. It was, quote, I saw this operation, was aware that cement, sand, and gravel were mixed at the property in a constant flow of concrete trucks. That's not amorphous. That's absolutely clear. Those affidavits are not, I believe, generally. Mr. Lewis testified today, absolutely saw it there, concrete batching. One person identifies a red silo there. There's no amorphous. The other thing I want to mention is, Mr. Uh, Leonardo made the comment that they didn't know about the overt act and that that's been the law for, for many, many years. Come on. You know, you can't say I got new affidavits by exactly what the rules required. I didn't have the time to respond. Uh, but if you did this, you'll put off every matter every time. That's exactly what's going to happen. One last thing I want to make as far as a legal point. This matter should be decided today for two issues. One is the standing issue. I want to be very clear about this. Tennessee law is very clear that you have to be a resident within 2,000 feet of a site to have standing in the case. We, we submit the authority to you. It's the uh, Collierville, citizens of Collierville, it's the town of Collierville. It's a court of appeals decision in 1998. You've got to be within 2,000 feet of a site, okay? I want to be clear about this. You can ask me about it. Beeman Park, his client, he identified them. They are, and we've got the maps, they are 14,000 feet from this site, okay? Seven times the legal standard. That's the case of uh, Collierville. We've raised that authority. Uh, we mentioned in our pleading that there was a question about standing. Citizens of Collierville, the town of Collierville, uh, 977 Southwest 2nd at 321. You've got to have standing to be in front of this board. They don't have it. So I, my comment is the board should take the action today to say that it is not appropriately received because there's not standing. And secondly, even if there was standing, that has been absolutely clear there was a non-conforming use on this property that qualifies here. And Mr. Leonardo admitted they didn't have any evidence of an intentional and voluntarily abandonment. He was asked that specifically at one of you. He didn't have it. We know what the law is, and so my request today is if we're going to keep okay, okay, time this way. So just to, to, to just so I understand, because it's complicated, and I just want to make sure I understand, you're, you originally said that uh, Zoning Administrator Michael was correct and based on the information he had, and that his argument said basically was two, had two aspects. One was... Uh, when the use started, in which you have provided information today uh, through uh, not only affidavits, but the expert testimony of, uh, and I don't know the, the title of a, of a chemist that who did the scientific study, and that um, the interpretation of the 30 days 
I'm mean, sorry, the 30 months is um, uh, centered around the concept of intentional abandonment, which for this site uh, as a commercial use, uh, which I think is under the section four of, of the code that you quote. And so that, that is the crux of what you have to, of your argument is that you're providing new evidence that it was in use uh, at a time when uh, it, it would be grandfathered, so to speak, and that uh, the 30 months, uh, regardless of whether that happened or not, uh, wouldn't apply because it was never abandoned and there's no evidence of that. That is correct. Okay. And, and, I, and I do want to respond, Ms. Taylor, to say that the front issue for this board today is a question of standing. Uh, you can look at that authority, uh, period. You've got to be within 2,000 feet. We've got an entity identified. We've got the maps 14,000 feet away. There is no standing here. That's not, that's not an academic issue. You've got to have standing to be in front of the board. The second one, though, with respect to your argument is, in all deference to Mr. Leonardo, Everybody knows the rules of this body are that papers are to be in by Monday. We don't operate like a court where you then turn supplemental, supplemental, supplemental. We'll be here forever on a matter like this. And so my point is it's a question to decide this today. I've talked to Mr. Leonardo about that before we started here today. I think we both want a decision. Uh, but I I'm saying in fairness, we played by the rules. We did exactly what you tell us to do every time. And what the zoning administrator has said repeatedly by Ms. Lamb and by John Mike. It's the board's decision, uh, period. And, and so, I, and I do want to clarify your last question about the act of abandonment. That's been the law here for many years, not recently. Nobody can say, I just got the papers and thought, oh gosh, I've got an overt act. That's been the law. Mr. Leonard was very bright. With respect to the 30 months, I don't know what to tell you other than the language is intentional and willful abandonment. And he admitted they don't have any evidence of that, period. Uh, so cessation versus abandonment are totally different and I appreciate the board's time. It's an incredibly thankless task to put in your time here and I've mentioned to several board members that are professionals. Your time is very valuable. We appreciate that. But in fairness, it's time to bring this thing to a close and I'm asking the board to number one, a motion that it should be dismissed for lack of standing. But secondly, notwithstanding that, notwithstanding that, because the proof is closed, they haven't identified anybody other than Beeman Park 14,000 feet away. But you, I mean, I don't understand the dismissal. I don't, but I mean, you all brought the case, right? So I mean. Somebody's contesting it though. Somebody's contested the matter uh, in front of the board. And that's the oh, So opposition. you're saying to dismiss the, the arguments, but they didn't, they didn't dispute your argument though, did they? I mean, I didn't, I didn't hear him say, I heard him say that if they had more time, they would try, they would try to find, yes. you know. And I guess my point, Mr. Taylor, is that with respect to everybody's clear, it's the board's decision. Going back and ask the zoning administrator again is really just going to stir the pot that much further. We'll come back. And basically, that's what they built the courthouse for. It's called a writ of certiorari, uh, and everybody knows how to file that. But at the end of the day, my point on standing is this. They're here in front of this board saying they object to the use on the site. That's their position. You've got to have standing to raise that, period. That's something every lawyer here would know. And secondly, I say the law, the Collierville law is very clear, 2,000 feet. That's what it says. They're 14,000. Secondly, on, on the issue of the affidavits and whatever else, I just can't believe somebody's going to credibly argue before this board that it wasn't clear about what was taking place in that site pre-74. It can't be any clearer. Uh, and so for all those reasons, I respect Mr. Leonardo, but it's, it's time for the board to make a decision in this case. And as I said, if somebody objects to it, they can go forward. But if you're going to defer it to get additional information, let's just, let's just keep going on and on and on. And then I'll respond and they'll respond. That's not the way this board works. This board says, turn it in by Monday. We did. We delivered it to him on Monday, and I called him on Monday. I never heard a word. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. White? I have a question for Mr. White and Mr. Dean, because if we are to make a decision today, uh, I want to be very clear that I understand when I'm looking at that statute, it still mentions a 30-month period. It does talk about the government having a burden of proof to show an intentional and voluntary abandonment. But the 30-month period is still referenced. And I, I understood you to say we're not sure what happened uh, after the 80s. And so to me, the proof seems slim on that point. And are there some factors you would point me to if we're deliberating on, on that part of it? I'm not saying I, 
I have decided. I just am curious what your position is on that. The only thing I can say is the normal and practical application. First of all, there's people here on the board that have got real estate expertise. Uh, generally, all laws are construed in favor of the property owner. So that's a general principle that you always hang your head on. Every chancellor I've ever been in front of has been aware of that principle. Um, and so it's to be interpreted solely and strictly in our favor. Uh, secondly, with respect to the 30 months, the language which was cited in Richland Creek and Chancellor Bynum cited was basically that there's got to be an overt act to show intentional and willful abandonment. And I was asked, is that three years? Is it 10 years? I don't know, but that's what the language says. And so the best comment I can give to you is that, uh, in fairness, uh, if you have a certain piece of property with a certain right on it, would you think you abandon it? You know, if you didn't use it, I don't care five years, 10 years, 15, would you feel like you abandoned the use of that property? I don't think so. I don't think anybody would think that way unless somebody came in and changed the use and said, I don't want to do a batch plant down here anymore. I'm going to put in a residential development or a commercial or retail. Then clearly they abandoned it. But as, as Mr. Dean responded earlier, if you had a gas station uh, and didn't use it for a long time, the pumps were there and you started parking cars on it. We see all that downtown happening on the places we used to pull in and and, and park for free. Uh, now they're, they're not quite so available, but my comment is, if you had the, the infrastructure still there and you use a separate use, it's exactly what Mr. Hollingshead said. I mean, there was never any, the infrastructure there, um, the bringing the materials off the river, it never changed. So what is the evidence before you that there was an intentional and willful abandonment? It's not here, folks. And Mr. Leonardo admitted it wasn't here. So I think it's the board's decision. I'd respectfully urge you to talk about the issue of standing and basically, without being repetitive, we played by the rules. We did exactly the way you tell us to do all the time, and we never heard a word. We didn't see a paper filed even today. It was an excellent argument by Mr. Leonardo, but we didn't have anything. Uh, and so I'd respectfully submit that no case would ever end here if you're going to allow people to just continue to submit things down in the future. And uh, that's, that's our argument. So we'd urge you to uh, basically find that there is a nonconforming use. Um, maybe it's in the record and I have missed it, but when did your client acquire the property? I think it was 2014, okay. a little before 2014. Thank you. Quick question for me too, Mr. White. So I, I agree with you. I, I agree that the government has to prove an o o overt act of abandonment and they, and I don't think they've done that. Um, and I think you've played by the rules. I just am, and, and I, and I think, Mr. Harper and you both make a good point about we don't, we don't want to keep having meetings back and forth. But but what I also want to make sure that that the government has a chance. Is it your position that they should have known as soon as you filed the appeal that they needed to go out and look for an overt act of abandonment based on the appeal being filed? Absolutely, and a long time before that. The law. They, they, what you're saying is they, they should have known that was coming or that was a possibility that they, they would need to prove that? I would say both, because the law about the uh, overt uh, act and abandonment is the law. You, you practice law, you understand lawyers, judges tell us all the time, you're presumed to know what the law is. The law has been the requirement for that for many, many years. And in this case, it was even <coughs> the subject of John Michael's letter, the letter of January of this year, he talked about abandonment. So for someone to come in and say, gosh, I didn't know about that until I got the affidavits, it's basically you were arguing in front of a judge. I didn't know what the, what the law was, judge, but I just found out on Monday. That's not the way it's done. I mean, no one can say that the law didn't say intentional and willful abandonment is required. That's been there on the books since 13.7208 G4 was enacted some years ago. That's the law. Mr. Leonardo was charged with knowing that. But if nothing else, I need to say this. If I were the lawyer on the side of this case and I got papers sent to me on the Monday in conformance with the rules, and I got a call from the other lawyer saying, call me if you want to discuss anything, I would have done something. I would have done something because you can't read those affidavits and not see that it totally nails that there was a concrete batching plant on the site before 1974. It's just, nobody can dispute that. I would have done something. I would have asked people in the community. I would have got them down there. Do you know anything differently? They can testify live, just like Mr. Lewis did. You can get affidavits. 
you can bring people live. If I was looking at a bullet like that, I would have done something. That's all I can say. I, would have, I may have even called the other lawyer and say, would you agree to defer it? I never got a request to defer anything. We came down here ready to try this case, did a great deal of time, had live witnesses come down here. Even today, before the hearing started, a very cordial conversation with Nick. I was never asked to defer anything. And we shouldn't defer it, it's the board's decision. That, in my opinion, is the way the board should act. And yes, additional information may always be more helpful. How can you disagree with that? But it's the board's decision. And I think it rests with you to make that decision. And I would urge you that uh, we've clearly covered it. And I read to you previously John Michael's decision, which we've talked about on several occasions. He just says, hey, if they show they had a legal concrete batching plan on the site before IR came into place, it's appropriate. That's where we are. That's where we are. And Can I, you I was, um, help me out with the timeline a bit? Um, we just discussed the property was purchased in 2014. We have a letter from the zoning administrator from January 18th, 2018, that says the use is not allowed. I think allowed. that's an error. I think it's 19. 2019 should be. Oh, it says 2018. Right, I think that's just a mistake. A mistake. Is that, okay. that right? yeah. This is one more uh, mistake by the zoning administrator. <laughs> 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 You're in yeah. trouble now, buddy. <laughs> well, we won't rule on that, on that simple mistake. <laughs> uh, the SP rezoning then clearly, or the attempt to rezone to SP clearly then happened before January 18th of 2019. It, it did. It started when the, the uh, Mr. Leonardo's uh, very good lawyer and very plugged in politically. When the new council member came in, uh, it was started almost immediately. And that was at the beginning of this very term of the council. So that was 2015, <coughs> 2015. I think uh, I probably got a copy of it. Well, what I'm saying is in 2015, mm -hmm. the client started looking at uh, the approval to get a rezoning. And the first district council person who is not here uh, was mm -hmm. supportive. And then uh, Sharon Hurt became the at-large. She brought it in front of the planning commission. We had two big hearings down here and it was unanimously approved. And then we moved to the Metro Council. Yeah, I'm still puzzled why you went through that or the applicant went through that process and now we're here today. I, w I want to be clear about what happened again, I, although it, I think legally it doesn't have a whole lot to do with it. As I said, right or wrong, Mr. Dean and I felt there was a good argument for a non-conforming use, and the client was discussed, informed, whatever, and we were also told that uh, you can approach the district council person and see if you would like to go that route. They have got a reputation for being very significant involved in the community. I don't know if I would have done it, but they did. I can't tell you how many meetings they went to where over and over they talked about what they do for the community, and there was always a different, will you give money to this school, do this, do this? They repeatedly would agree to those things, and finally it became clear that, you know, it, they weren't going to get consensus, uh, period, despite the fact that we had a unanimously approved bill. And so we went through five council members, uh, and they finally just came back to us and said, if we've got that argument, we'd like to take a shot at it. That's what happened. It was, it was three years into the process, and, and it, probably a, an incredible waste of time and money. Lawyers, engineers, and everybody else trying to get something done. We would have preferred, pardon me, we would have preferred to get it worked out in the community. But for somebody to say, well, if that didn't work, you do something else, of course you do. That's what lawyers do. You can argue in the alternative. You can do lots of things. Uh, but we tried to go the route that would take the community by, and we thought we had it. When you get a unanimous decision on an issue like this at the Planning Commission, that ought to tell and you And Mr. Something. White, um, this was obviously noticed to the community, and there's on, the only people who are in opposition is the uh, lawyer and one neighborhood person here today. That's, that's my understanding. Again, initially, the person that first contacted uh, the administration was a gentleman that lives about six or seven miles away. Uh, but I don't know. Mr. Leonardo's always said he identifies his client as Beeman Park, uh, and that's a very, you know, very well-respected group, um, and that's what we've been told, and that's what he identified today, he said my client is Beeman Park, uh, period. But I'm sure there's other people that have contacted him, but um, nobody testified today. It was basically a presentation by him, so one more time, I don't think we could have been any clearer about what our position was in accord with the rules and heard nothing, crickets, until today. Okay, any other questions for Mr. White? Okay, we will close the public hearing. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, I appreciate, uh, especially the outgoing members. We're going from three Davids to one, uh, yeah. and uh, 
I don't think I thank the lawyers when I that long lit me a list, so <laughs> sorry. I, I've got a question for our legal counsel and our other lawyers. The, to me, the, the, the two big issues were the new information of, of when this thing started as a concrete plant and then also the concept of the 30 months doesn't uh, matter unless we approve willful intent to abandon. And I don't think, I haven't heard that argument or that piece of it as it applies to commercial property. I don't remember it. And so I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on Mr. White's argument and, and Mr. Dean's argument on that point. And is it, and then I want to hear from the zoning administrator about uh, the, the letter and what you went through before, but talk about your thoughts on that argument that we heard quite a bit about. With regard to the notion of the, the responsibility of the government to demonstrate that a 30 month cessation of use is somehow uh, not something that ruins legally nonconforming status unless, unless there is demonstrated evidence of an intent to vacate that use. First of all, we never got to that analysis. I should say I never got to that analysis. You see from my January 2019 letter, we never got past the first element, which was, is there a legally nonconforming use? Was there a use there that preceded the restrictive zoning change? We didn't have evidence of that. So I didn't get to steps two, three, four, and beyond. Now, with the information that's been presented to the board today, it was filed with our office on Monday, that greater body of information likely would have triggered a review to see, all right, do we see any information that suggests, first of all, that there were no 30-month discontinuations of the concrete batching plant use. If there were demonstrations or suggestions of, the thir of any sort of cessation of use for that period, or even the absence of confirmation of continuity of use, then we would start to look to see if there was information indicating the intentional vacation of that use. So perhaps I've over-answered, but we never, I never had to get to that in late 2018, early 2019 in my analysis. Uh, the information presented today could potentially trigger that kind of review, would have if, in fact, the information had been submitted in late 2018 when we were conducting this review. I hope that's responsive to the question as posed on your first question. What about, yeah. what I mean, about the issue of standing <laughs> in this 14,000 versus 2,000? I mean, we're not something. here if that's true. Right? Uh, yeah, no. We've heard that before, but the standing question with regard to opposition to a case is something mm -hmm. the board can take into consideration in terms of whether or not to, um, what weight to give that evidence, if any, uh, as to whether or not folks get to speak. We never deny folks the opportunity know, to speak but, here at the board. But if we it basically on the side says 14,000, you know, and it's only two, and it's 2,000, there's a reason that law was put into place, because they wanted people who are directly impacted by whatever use, not somebody that's seven times the distance. But I, doesn't that only apply to how we perceive the opposition's point? Because No, we this would, is who can bring... No, the, 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 Mr. White, they brought the case. I mean, John, our, the zoning administrator said you can't have a concrete plant. The concrete plant folks said, no, you're wrong. We're going to have new evidence. And, and Mr. Leonardo was supporting basically the, the argument that no, you can't have a concrete plant. So even if we, even if, if we said he doesn't have standing, the case still evolves but, to, you said no concrete plant, but, you said, yeah, oh I no. think we should, the case is still there. But I think Mr. White was saying, this is a, not our BZA rules, these are you know, state rules that basically you need this standing to argue one of these cases. But well, it, it may have been that we, it may, it may have, he may have been made, made the argument that once Mr. Leonardo admitted that his client was further away and didn't have a chance to come back and say something otherwise that we should, that he shouldn't have been permitted to argue. Mm -hmm. But even if, I guess the, it still doesn't, to me it has nothing to do with the two fundamental questions of was the concrete plant there before 1974 and how should we address this 30 month issue? And if we determined that the 30 month issue is not a, uh, an issue and that it was there before 74, it answers the two questions but, that you but my, basically said my, no about. No, that, those were your reasons. But my no. board members who are members of the bar, what do you think about the whole standing issue? I don't think we have to address standing. I no, agree with John. Yeah. We hear from people. Uh, we can assign the weight to that that we want to. 
understanding that to me the standing requirement is in effect because as you said you want to deal with people that are most directly impacted by the decisions we're making but and I don't think we have to decide and have, and have a benefit from our decision and one have way a or the other from the decision. that's the whole part of standing but I, I guess I guess we from my perspective on the standing issue I mean we've never asked we always ask someone to give their name and address, but we've never said, do you live okay. within well, three miles of the of the issue? And all this person was doing, so, I mean, they're not they're yeah. not named on the docket yeah. or so, anything. I mean, they just were given yeah. their opinion. So I don't so, see so, this. So the other issue, which I agree with my outgoing BZA board member, David Harper, is if we allow people to kind of add on and add on and add on, we're never going to hear cases up here. And you could always present more evidence for any case. And as Mr. White said, Chancery Court's a half mile down the road. That's what Chancery Court, if we get it wrong, they get the final say. Yeah, uh, David, and I'm sorry, the, the, I think I brought the, up the issue of deferral and, and it wasn't really meant to, to have the, the issue that you had of, in terms of a circular thing. It really was meant, uh, the way I, I see this is that they presented evidence, asked the zoning administrator to review it. The zoning administrator said, hey, I, I, what I see is I don't see any evidence before this date, and you got to prove that. And so they appealed to us on it, and instead of just going and finding research and taking it back to the zoning administrator and said, hey, look what I found, you know, I've got the evidence. That was the only reason to me, it was to say, and, and it's not uncommon for us to say, you know, you guys can solve this on Monday, but, and you don't need us to. And I'd rather you look at it. That but, was the only reason. It wasn't. It wasn't for the I, circular. I concern. am personally against the deferral because, as Mr. White said, he presented the papers to the opposing counsel on Monday. Yeah, me he too. He called the opposing um, counsel and said, "Hey, call me if you have any issues." The opposing counsel submitted nothing in writing to us today. I don't think there's a need to kind of push this off and let him possibly come up with some other argument that he could have presented. No, I, I agree. I, it was really meant to, to have, to allow them to solve it outside of our venue. Okay. That, that was the re only reason I... Okay, so we're in the discussion part, yeah. it sounds like. Well, it, and I'll, I'll <coughs> kick the dead horse one more time. Uh, I, I think it's also unreasonable to expect the zoning administrator to respond or to reanalyze every item A appeal uh, with uh, when supporting documents are submitted on Monday because it's it's not just one case. I mean, we have a whole docket. So it, I think that could potentially be time-wasting, and and that's all I'll say about that. Yeah. Now, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, you go. Uh, well, I, I, I think Mr. White and Mr. Dean have, have solidly uh, proved their case, and, and I, I see no evidence that uh, there was ever any intentional abandonment uh, of, of the use on the site, and I and I and I believe there is sufficient evidence uh, that it, this batching of concrete was done at this property at some point. And uh, e even though there were ancillary uses on the site, uh, they were not. They certainly weren't counter to batching uh, this if, if we're going to use the analogy of the gas station you know uh, not only were the the gas pumps <coughs> never removed you know it, it was it was never something else so uh, is, is that a motion uh, I'll, I'll move that the zoning administrator initially did not air but based upon uh, evidence submitted uh, in in these proceedings that uh, the decision uh, ultimately is uh, an error and that the uh, uh, there never was an abandonment of the non-conforming use, and it sh uh, should still be allowed. I will second the motion that the zoning administrator aired. I was going to make a friendly amendment, if I could. Yes. Because I think maybe we would be more specific. I think we would you consider a motion that there has been uh, both three affidavits and three live witnesses presented today that indicated that there was use of this property prior to 1976 and 1984 or whatever the dates are, and that uh, after As a batching plant or of, a, of the stated use, and after that, to the extent that 
there was opposition that had standing. They did not meet the burden of establishing that there was an intentional abandonment of that use uh, during the time period. Is that fair? Yeah, I, sure. Okay, so that's a friendly amendment, and I will second that amendment. Okay, so I understand that the amendment, though, is is it the zoning administrator? Because I don't, the, to me, the zoning administrator did not err at the time he made the decision, and I want to be really clear about that. And but, that was, and that's but, what I said. Well, yeah, but the whole thing is today, based on what we heard today, we've got to either uphold the zoning administrator or say he erred. It's and nothing personal. We're just making a ruling based on what's in front of us. And even John Michael, I think, said, had he had the information we heard today, he would have written the letter differently and done more things. Right? Okay, so the motion's been made, properly seconded discussion. This is, yeah, I mean, th th this is, it's not unusual for us to, based on new information, make a decision. And, and to me, the, the question is, is the new information uh, compelling and thorough enough to decide, uh, or does it require uh, more time? And I think that that's ultimately how people have to decide. I do think that there was evidence that it uh, was used prior uh, to 1974, and the, um, you know, certainly our you know, members of, of, of this board uh, and the appellant's attorneys have, have talked about that 30, about the abandonment uh, aspect of, of this 30 month rule, which is, uh, I haven't seen on this board yet because we haven't had a case like this. So, you know. It, it, okay. More discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Six to nothing, passes unanimously. Seven. Seven. Oh, seven. I can't, I'm already left. Yeah. Seven to nothing. Um, Ms. Lamb, we, I think we want to break. to say before we get started about your wonderful service on the BZA. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> Ms. Lamb, get us started. The next case we'll hear is case 2019-092. I also uh, would recommend to the board that we hear 2093 at the same time. They're adjacent parcels, same property, same project. Um, so if that is your sure. pleasure, we would like to that's do that. Good. Let's get um, started. Property is 1301 F Porter Road and 1301 E Porter Road. Um, you'll see the zoning map here showing the zoning is R6. This is a request to construct two single family houses, I believe, on each property. And will um, the applicant please come forward? Is the applicant here? It, oh, Joey, get up here. Okay, uh, continue. So this is a, a variance request, uh, both from the sidewalk um, requirements as well as the requirements for um, access and driveway requirements. Aerial photography here showing you the parcel at issue. This is the site plan for the proposed project at this property. And then the photography showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 92 or 93? Seeing none, Mr. Hargis, you'll have five minutes for each case, so technically 10 if you need it. Um, five's fine. The, uh, sorry, uh, ladies and gentlemen board, I'm Joey Hargis, law firm, Baker Donaldson, representing the uh, landowner. Uh, the appellant's here to my right, sorry to take a phone call uh, during your break, and uh, this is uh, Mr. John Pirtle, the, the builder of the site. Uh, we're before you today on two issues, and if, if I could, only take the, the somewhat, uh, I guess, a little easier of the two, and planning commission has recommended uh, as in regards to the sidewalk variance for us to, to maintain Porter Road sidewalks as are, repair if necessary, and paying in lieu of fee along Porter. We're agreeable to those conditions. Um, we are asking for a variance on Carter, and I if, don't know if your photographs show that, Ms. Lamb. Uh, along the Carter frontage is, is a large uh, treed area that acts as a green buffer for this development, as well as adjoining neighbors. 
to the uh, south. I'm not sure. But that was on the planning recommendations too, right? Or yes, they, it was. They just said give you a variance for Carter, keep the existing sidewalk. I mean, keep the existing cool. trees and and such on on Carter, and pay the in lieu of on on Porter, with a little minor upgrade for ADA compliance at the intersection of Carter and Porter, uh, and maintain and and keep that. So hope that sort of sets the record on. Uh, on the sidewalk issue, the, the other variances before us, uh, this lot, these two lots are in the contextual overlay. And the contextual overlay requires uh, that you can't have more than a 12 foot wide or 12 foot long area for parking or driveways. And Ms. Lamb, if you could go back to my site plan, please. If you could go to the site plan. Our, our largest challenge and the reason that we had to put this parking in the front yard is that, as you'll note on the on the drawing before you, there's a metro alley there. Uh, but unfortunately, that alley is not constructed. Uh, the larger issue is that the neighbor to the east has constructed not only their fence in the alley on our part, on our half of the alley, right at the boundary of our property line in the alley, but their house actually sits in the alley itself. Um, the alley right away is, I believe on that, is 12 to 15 feet in, in width. The house sits approximately 8 to 10 feet from the property line. So there is no way to access the rear of our property through this metro alley. <coughs> so that having been said, what we've arranged is a one-way drive that comes in off of Porter. Uh, you see the angled parking spots and parallel spots along uh, Carter and then exit out the driveway that's at the southeast corner of ours. So the, the issue, the, the sort of the unique characteristics, which is one of the hardship requirements, is this, this, this alley encroachment by the adjoining property owner. And so are they, I guess are these three bedroom units? Is that they, why you... They are, sir. Yes, sir. Three bedroom units. Uh, we, we do understand that, that, you know, what the code re requires there. But if you imagine, I speak from personally, my two daughters, I've got daughters now 21 and 19. Um, you've got mom and dad have a car, the adult or teenage child also has vehicle. You can see where there's the, you, what the code requires versus reality in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we're setting aside uh, parking for each of those units at an additional space per unit. So you end up with the 12 spaces that are there. Uh, you had a, an email from, I believe, uh, Councilman Withers, who's the adjoining, <coughs> excuse me, council member. I spoke with Councilman Withers uh, after receipt of his email this morning and spoke to him on the phone and discussed the issue uh, that, that why we're before this board and he uh, was was understood our situation and, and did not have any objection to our request as well as the uh, the local council member who's who's present here today. Questions for the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? No sir, again just for the record our hardships are the, the clearly unique situation which the encroachment in the existing metro alley forced us to push the property. Uh, you do have some topography issues along Carter and are, are really a desire to hang on to the existing pretty dense foliage there, both as a visual screen and somewhat as an audible screen, because just immediately south of this is railroad tracks with, on an active line, so. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, thank you. Close the public hearing discussion. Does anyone have a motion? I, well, I'm not in favor. So, um, yeah, I should not make the motion. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you know that three other people won't be? Oh, I don't know, because there was Anyone? no, um, because there were no questions. So really. But I'll say that um, if it's zoned in the contextual overlay, that's something that um, the residents of that area um, petitioned and it went through council. I don't see it noted as being zoned as Please. Yeah, let's please do. The, this is in the contextual overlay. We, we do comply with both the height restrictions and size restrictions of the units. Uh, it's just the issue of, of the 12 foot driveway widths in the front setback is my issue with that. Parking in the front, which yes. is not allowed in the contextual overlay, correct? It actually is allowed, but it's not within the, the front setback and not greater than the width of 12 feet. And, and that, that was my suggestion. You, I, we had no choice but to, given the, the unique arrangement of what's sort of, you know, had, had we had access to the alley, we could certainly r rear load and, and side load these, these, uh, these cars. But. Yeah, I, just, I don't know, I just think some action should have been taken maybe against the person who built in the alley. Well, would, well, I, would. The, the only agency that can do that is Metro government. 
there's not there's oh, not any private action we could we could take upon. I that. understand. Okay. It just this is an unfortunate situation for the neighbors. I think. Other discussion or motions. So the the only <coughs> variance that, that we're seeking then, or he that the appellant is seeking, is the relief from the driveway requirements. Am I correct? And, and the sidewalk. We, we, we are agreeing You're to, agreeing to all with the conditions of okay. planning. That is the right. planning's recommendation. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll move that the uh, due to the uh, unique situation of the uh, un, undeveloped alley and uh, adjacent property uh, that we grant the variance uh, with the condition uh, let's do two cases do separate. Two. So okay. you're doing 92 Oh, I'm sorry. First. Yes. So for 92, case 2019-92, I move that we grant the variance. Uh, and the uh, hardship is the unique situations of, of the property, with the undeveloped alley and the uh, encroachment of the neighboring property into the uh, undeveloped alley. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second my outgoing board members motion discussion yes I don't know that did you cover the fact that they um, will abide or by they, the planning yeah. recommendation you add that I, I mean not to repeat that uh, with the sidewalks the, okay yes is that a friendly amendment or? and I'll agree with that okay. okay so discussion seeing none all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed aye. did you vote aye. okay so that is uh, <laughs> Five, four, one against, one abstain. Okay. Okay. So uh, next case. So for case 93, 93. I, I make the same motion uh, with the same uh, conditions. Okay, and I'll do the same second. Um, motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Opposed. How many? Just one. Did you? Raise your hand. For opposition. Okay. Four. Oh, four. Okay. So five, four, one against, one not voting. Okay. Next case. Good luck. Mr. Chairman, uh, just thank you both for your service. I, I spent a brief time uh, in my prior life uh, working for each of you. Yes. So I wish you both in your endeavors. Thank you, Joey. Good to see you. Okay. Next, next case for the board to consider is case 2019-097 involving property at 3601 Nolensville Pike. And will that applicant please come forward? This is a request from a variance from size and material requirements on fencing for automotive sales. Property or zoning map here shows you the uh, zoning of the property is CS. Aerial photography here giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Before you now is the site plan, you'll see the dotted line shows you where the existing fence is. And this is the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Um, before the appellant speaks, I will say the, the issue here, the variance request is that um, the code prohibits chain link fence within 25 feet of the right of way. Um, the code does require a barrier between autom uh, automobiles and vehicular sales and the uh, public, but it, it, there are regulations on the height and material in this, uh, the existing fence, does, chain link fence does not meet those requirements, and so, so he's required a uh, so applied for a variance to uh, keep the existing chain link fence. If it were a wrought iron fence, would he need to be in front of us? Wrought iron fence, he would, no, he would not need to be, wrought iron fence is allowed within the right of, okay, within a certain height. I think um, wrought iron fence, it, the height maximum would be um, between 24 and 36 inches. Okay. Depending on where it's located, it could be within 25 feet of the right of way if it's wrought iron, but so not if it's chain link. So the link. code just doesn't like chain link fences. Basically. Not within 25 feet of the right of way. Okay. Very good. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 97? Okay. Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make his desired presentation. Please identify yourself by name, address, why you're here. I'm Mahmoud Ghassim Nijad, owner of property 3601 Northern Road. Well, the 36-inch wrought iron fence actually is not a fence. It's that high. Everybody can reach 
damage those cars. The, the reason I put that fence up, every week I had an incident of damaging about 10, 12 cars right in the front, you see, by deep scratches. And it cost me a lot of money to repair those. It wind me, uh, I had to put that fence up that high. And it has to be a chain link so the hand doesn't go through it. The 36 inch height fence, right iron, anybody can pass by and get a sharp object and go all over those hoods. It costs too much money to repair those hoods. When did you uh, erect this fence? It's been almost a year and a half or so. Okay. Since I put that fence up, I never had any kind of incident. No breaking, <coughs> no damage to the cars. Okay. So I want to read a letter that we have board members in our packet from Mike Freeman, the duly elected councilman from this district, District 16. He says, I submitted the property codes department uh, for having a fence that does not meet the current code. The following is taken from the regulation of auto repair and used auto sales. As I told the business owner in an email, I'm working through all the related businesses on the no bro, I guess it's a new hipster name for that area out there, and will be reporting all those that are not in compliance. So he's just kind of working down the list and saying, and he was the one that turned you in. Sadly, some will be grandfathered because they had fences erected prior than 2011. Uh, then he says, chain link fence, barbed wire fence, razor wire fence are similar prohibited 25 feet with a right of way. Fencing or walls within 25 feet of the right, public right of way shall not be more than 36 inches in height. I hope you guys will decide to uphold the current law. You will have another case, well, you will have another case coming before you next month and probably more in the future. And that's from Mike Freeman, the council person. So. What do you, how do you respond to that? He says the law is 36 inches and he's basically going down his district and telling codes to people that don't comply. Well, I guess we have to reconsider about the law. 36 inches height fence, as I said, is not a fence. Okay. Any kids can jump off of that fence. Sure. Questions for the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? No, okay, we're going to close the public. Is there anyone here? No one here in opposition. Okay, we're close the public hearing discussion. Well, I mean, you know, I, I do think it, to me, it was pretty compelling in the applicant's letter to say that, you know, I had, there was a long history of damage to my property and I put up the fence and I have no damage. And yet at the same time, I understand the councilman's, uh, need for our desire to have, uh, I would say, to beautify the area and, and, and take down some of these. To, to beautify no row. Yeah. And so, I, I mean. No row. No row. I mean, I, you know. I'm so unhip now. I, I, you know, it, it, I don't know what the ultimate answer is, uh, but it, it seems like you know, it, it, it would be great if they could if they could kind of work together and figure it out and he could keep the fence for another couple months until he figured it out. But As you I'm, know, the councilman's pretty clear. He's saying, not only did I turn him <coughs> in, I'm turning in everybody else. I'm going down my district and I guess he's got his tape measure and if it doesn't comply, future BVA cases. Well, uh, go ahead. I would just say in a situation like this, I, I do tend when you're dealing with a car dealership like this, I do understand his desire to protect his inventory, uh, which may be different in some other situations when people just erect a chain link fence. I guess he could have gone with a different building material, but given that the fence is in place, it does seem to me uh, that it might be appropriate to grant a variant. And I will say it doesn't look bad to me either. I mean, well, it's new. It's uh, not torn or sagging in any way. So that's, that's sort of my thought. Well, I, and I'm, I'm not inclined to give a long-term variance because I think this is a rapidly changing part of town. And I think, a, a, you know, the, the uh, and I think that to have, you know, I'd, I'd written in my notes, you know, can we do a, you know, a three year or some kind of period of time mm -hmm. that, you know, would allow the protection of property, but yet, 
not have a permanent fence. And so, and I would be even willing to have less than that to, again, kind of work out the issues of, you know, what can I do? And is there an alternative wrought iron fence of a different height that the councilman would and would support that that might be a more permanent solution, but yet protect the property in the meantime? And that, again, it was out of respect for the issues that the property owner raised, which I think are legitimate, but yet, uh, you know, I, I don't see, I, 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 don't, I would not vote for a permanent variance on the fence because I don't think that the hardship's there. I think there's a temporary hardship of protecting your property till a, a better solution is determined. Well, I see the hardship for the, the fence being five feet high to protect the property, but I don't see the hardship in the materials of the fence. And you can erect a fence that's opaque um, that would protect the property and it would be a different material. Not yeah. Yeah, so sorry. are you suggesting no, no. that we could give him a, um, like a variance to build a five foot instead of a three foot, but make it out of wrought iron rather than, than a chain link? Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't say wrought iron. There's uh, aluminum. There's different materials that can be used. So I wouldn't, <coughs> it, it would look like a wrought iron fence, but there's different materials. And I really, I, I would like to, I, I'm okay kind of headed down that way, but I almost would rather have the council members. I mean, I, I, I know what he wrote to us, but I'd like, and I wish that he had the opportunity to be here, but I'd like to hear uh, kind of his thoughts on that type of solution for this, because if we are gonna have other cases. Well, I mean, he, at the last paragraph of his email to us, I hope you guys will decide to uphold the current law. You'll have another case coming before you next month and probably more in the future. That's his opinion. Well, and is there a, a problem with Christina's idea? Because he did not ask for a five-foot fence. He asked for him to be allowed to continue with that fence and that, with that material. Since he did not ask for you know, a five-foot fence, could we even do that if we wanted to? We could reopen the public hearing and ask him. <laughs> Would you build a fence that's five feet tall out of a non-chain link material? Well, it is possible, but as I said, I have to have a fence. The hand cannot go through it. The raw iron fence, it has about six to eight inch gap beneath it. So why is it important that the hand not go through the fence? Because the body can't the, go through. They were through. scratching with a sharp object all the way from the beginning or the corner of Veritas to about 100 feet of Nolansby Road. Each car gets damaged. It takes a lot of money and time to fix it. You assume about 10, 15 car of you in one week has to go to the body shop. Money-wise, sure. time-wise. Okay. So, okay, close the public hearing again. Mr. Mr. Chairman, yes. one point to make that may be helpful to the applicant as well as the board in analyzing the material. The code allows that walls um, that are required to separate the automobiles from the right-of-way, or from the public, rather, is. Um, it does provide a list of materials, and it says the wall shall be constructed of concrete, stone, split-faced masonry, or other sim similar materials, or solid ma masonry pillars with wrought iron or other similar materials between pillars. So it doesn't have to be a wrought iron fence. There are other materials that the But there's still gaps. I think that's what he's saying. That so yeah. there, well, there are fences, and I will say, I'm just trying to look on the internet for one of them that we specified for a property along Charlotte Avenue. I can't find it right now. But that don't have gaps, and they're not chain link. And I, I wish I knew the name of well, it. Well, and I would like to know is part of why he wants this because if I see the car, I may go over there and buy it. If, if it's a fence that I can't even see the cars, not only can I not damage them, but I may not see them. You know, he has uh, cars for sale. He's not just storing cars. Yeah, he wouldn't want a solid stone fence because yeah, you know, you, right, you're selling cars. Right. I, feel like, I feel like the, the I can only guess as to the intent, but it, it's an aesthetic issue with that's that's been codified, but it, it, there's a real practical issue that it overlooks or, or did not foresee and, and, and is certainly does not address. And if I were to make a motion, I, I'm going to, I would invoke the the so-called Herbert rule, that the extra, extraordinary uh, conditions and, and that vandalism and and the display of the of the vehicles uh, cannot be accommodated. Uh, 
you know, given the material. Yeah, I'm, and like, and I would, I would be willing to support that for just a very short period of time, two years, three years, and have him come back because I think it is a rapidly changing uh, area. And okay. you know, I mean, so I, I maybe, so but, I, but I also, like I said, I, my my first preference would be to you. Someone for it for a month and have yeah, him have the council work, person and have him work it out because we're gonna if the, count, yeah. if the council the council members, person's a reporting people in Nauru or whatever <laughs> there's going to be a bunch of them well and we need some the, guidance on that and like I said and that would allow him to keep the fence until so for a, that purpose I would move that we defer it because I think there's a bunch more and we just need to get the council person to come up with a solution and if there's a phase out that he's agreeable to. Okay, so I'll move that we defer this uh, one month to when somebody else is here. April 18th. April 18th, <coughs> and then they can, and, the, and we'll invite Councilman Mike Friedman here, or he could submit a more detailed letter of okay. kind of what we're thinking. So that's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. We're deferring the case. Talk to your council person. He'll be back in front of this board on April 18th. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next case is case 2019 103 involving property at 1719 McKinney Avenue. Is the applicant here on this proper on this case? He had to leave. Yeah. So before you is the zoning map showing you the zoning of the property as R6. This is a request to conduct interior renovations to a church without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. I would note that the planning department has made the recommendation that um, the current existing sidewalks be maintained in compliance with ADA uh, requirements as well as dedicating the right of way. Before you now is the aerial photography showing you the surrounding area. You'll see there are some existing sidewalks on the property. So did you, did you all have an, what was the issue with the planning recommendations? Well, my name is Kendall Tucker and I'm the pro tem at the church. And we're going to remodel the adjacent building, 1719. And I was just going to do the remodeling on the inside and it's not new construction. So I didn't think that we had to, I appealed it because I didn't think we needed so it's sidewalks. Right, but, yes. the, but the, 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 the law says you have to have sidewalks. I mean, you, that, you know, that you're doing enough work, it triggered the law and the planning department said, hey, we, you know, it's okay if you don't build sidewalks, but we'll give you a variance. But if you give us the right of way in case we ever decide as a city to come in and build new sidewalks, we can go ahead and build sidewalks as the city needs to with the right of way. And and that's that's what the planning commission yes. recommended. And and most folks, if they agree with the planning commission, they're on the consent agenda. Okay. So you being here tells me, well, maybe you didn't agree with the planning commission. And that's why I asked, tell me okay, what I mean, part of that doesn't appeal to I you? I don't quite or? understand the building of the sidewalks. Okay. Now I kind of make this a little bit clearer. Yeah, for I'm sorry. So we have your council person with us yes, too. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to speak now or later? Uh, I'll wait. I'll okay. You. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how much remodeling are you doing? How much does it cost? And what exactly are you doing to the well, building? Um, we're just taking the drywall out and putting in the central air unit. That's it? Yes. Uh, how did this trigger? Mm -hmm. I think this is a case where the nonprofit doesn't have its, it's assessed value. It's That's right. This is lower. because this is a church. The assessed value would be zero, and they're doing an interior oh. renovation, and so therefore oh. it automatically triggers sidewalks. Automatically, um, presumably, no matter yeah. what. And again, okay. that that's one. I don't know planning's Ooh, that's um, reasoning, but you know. Well, if it's zero, yeah. If your assessed value in the law of the city is zero, yeah. Any re because normally it's what fifty percent of an yeah. interior. Fifty percent. That's right. Okay. But this is not the church; it's the residence beside the church. Okay. That the church owns. Church, church owns. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So HVAC system and just some drywall. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm? Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, so you have sat here for hours and hours. Tell us. <laughs> Please identify yourself for a record. Uh, and just Re tell us a little bit, and we'll, uh, we'll Reginald get to. Reginald Brock, mm -hmm. pastor of the same Matthew Amy Church, mm -hmm. and the uh, facility we're talking about is a duplex okay. uh, next to the church. Yep. And okay. we are re renovating the uh, church. I mean the uh, property okay. for rental purposes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Let's uh, close the public hearing. I'm sorry. Did you say for oh. rental purposes? Yep. What? Yeah. <coughs> Council person. Good evening. Um, Press the button. Speak. Good evening to all of you. Thank you uh, so much. I just wanted to be here in support of these guys. Uh, there are already sidewalks on, on there, and I know there's nothing you can do about the uh, actual variance and, and sidewalk variance. That's, that's a me problem. problem. But I know that uh, this is something that, that shouldn't be, and had a, I had a problem with this, so I'm here to speak on behalf of them because they're, they're meeting the needs uh, of the community okay. and some of the things that we have. Okay. All right? Thank you. All right. Okay, so... Um, so did the council person just say they, they were going to fix that in council? So. <laughs> is that we're going to try. Mean? That's one of those. Okay. So we're going to close the public hearing. You know, well, to me, say it change the facts <coughs> if they're doing this to rent this property? Because if it, even if it, it's I mean, owned it's for by... the ministry of the church. I mean, who, who are you renting this to? Sir? Who's renting? Who's going to be staying in these? Well, we haven't made a mind up. I'm going to try to... It's going to be affordable housing? Affordable <coughs> section eight or something. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. It's church. So. I, don't, I don't understand the issue with dedicating the right-of-way. What's the... Why wouldn't you do that? Well, I didn't quite understand because when I was first told okay. about sidewalks is if <coughs> Metro was going okay. to charge us to do this or okay. either we had to so let's, yeah, let's yeah. This. so if you dedicate the right-of-way it's mm -hmm. basically saying if Metro ever comes in and builds a longer sidewalk or wider sidewalk yes, they get the land to do that okay yes, but in all reasonableness not in our lifetime Metro is going <laughs> to do that they could I could be wrong but most likely not so do you have any objection of dedicating the right away doesn't cost you anything no, no okay very good okay so I move that we um, approve the variance that they do not have to pay from the sidewalk fund and they're going to dedicate the right-of-way um, due to the mission of the church and the support of the council person second uh, mr. Motion. chairman one point of clarification do you all planning had recommended that they maintain the current uh, sidewalks in compliance with any ADA requirements. I don't know if you want to include that or if you want to leave that out, but because that was one of planning's recommendations, I wanted to make sure it was addressed. Leave it out. Leave it out. Okay. No, I don't want to leave that. Leave that out. Okay. So that's the motion. Motion's been made. And uh, is there a second? Second. Motion been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Well, I, I'm just looking at the scope of work. Um, I might vote in favor if you would say something about the unusually small... Okay, yes. So then part of the motion that basically this is an HVAC, you know, renovation and drywall. So it's just minimal amount of well, remodeling. It's, it, it, it's similar to other cases that we've had where because it's owned by a nonprofit, the valuation it was so is much not yeah. accurate and therefore it was probably triggered in a way that it wouldn't have been triggered for... Had it not been a not-for-profit. Fully... Okay. Revalued, okay. but yes, I will change my motion to that. Okay, so is that a good? You second that motion? Okay. Any more discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank Don't you very good much. Ministry. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Okay, um, Ms. Lamb, next. Next case is case 2019-104 involving property at 4501 Murphy Road, requesting a variance from sidewalk requirements. Another uh, request for an interior renovation uh, to build, to do that renovation without building sidewalks or paying into the sidewalk fund. For you now is the zoning map showing you the zoning of the property as CS. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan for the proposed project and the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 104? 
Seeing none, Mr. Cuthbertson, you'll have five minutes to make your desired presentation. Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dwayne Cuthbertson, 2206 21st Avenue South. Um, before you, just a fairly simple request for a variance of the sidewalk uh, requirement. The requirement would ask us to take this streetscape project out and rebuild it to the current MCSP standard. Uh, we're asking for a variance of that for what I feel like are fairly clear reasons, but we're also asking for a variance of the, uh, the requirement to pay the fee in lieu. Um, as I'm sure you all are know, as I'm sure you all know, this is the Sylvan Park roundabout. Um, our property is right at the roundabout, at the intersection of Murphy and Westlawn. Um, this metro project was built back in 2014. It was completed in 2014. Metro built it to a standard, um, but apparently it wasn't to the MCSP standard. Um, they wanted to establish a, a uniform streetscape, and so they determined what the best standard was, and they built it. Um, so my client has uh, a restaurant across the street, and he this building came available, and he is looking to um, expand his brand and open a, a restaurant in the existing building. What he's attempting to do is effectively um, update the 2100 square foot building. Uh, it used to be local taco, and uh, he wants to use the existing building, but update bathrooms, kitchens, do some interior uh, upgrading to the aesthetics as well as exterior. Uh, he wants to renovate the roof. The only site work that he's anticipating is a 500 square foot expansion of the existing patio. There's no major site work outside of that scope um, anticipated with this project. So the, the total cost, uh, projected cost of this uh, project is about $324,000, and that is just enough to trigger the sidewalk requirement. Um, the fee in lieu would, uh, if you're using both frontages, which I'll point out that this is a uniquely shaped lot, and for the size of the property, it's a, it's a small lot. But, but what would it be just for Murphy Road? Because that's all planning's asked for you to do. Murphy Road's 160 feet, so that, uh, I didn't do the math, but I think that's somewhere in the twenty-two thousand, um, twenty-two excuse me, twenty-two thousand uh, dollar range. But um, Mr. Taylor, our, our argument is that the sidewalks are already built to a metro standard. And how do you respond to the council person's argument that uh, you're the beneficiary of a probably a multi-million dollar? Uh, public works project and sure. that you should have some responsibility for those projects that are not yet done in other places. And I would think, I would think that the improvements that have been made to the restaurants along this stretch over the last 10, 15 years have contributed a significant amount of property taxes that have uh, contributed to general budgets that go into capital improvements, such as the one on Murphy Road. Uh, my client's looking to upgrade the existing restaurant building and will certainly increase the value and will kick in additional property taxes that will go to fund capital improvements outside of this area. And so I'd, I would suggest that he has, or the property owner has contributed um, to the cost of this metro project. Other questions for the applicant? So why not just include this in cost of doing business, right? I think for my client, it's the principle of the matter and that for him and that Metro built a standard sidewalk out there just four years ago. Um, if he followed the letter of the law, he would rip this out and knock it out of alignment. Um, I don't think well, anybody it, wants that outcome. Well, it's, it, it, I mean, and, and that that could certainly be done on principle, but I, I don't know that it would be cost effective versus you know the no, of course, paying, uh, the Murphy Road, and so it, it really does kind of come down to that circular argument of you know, and that's something we've struggled with as a board is you can rationalize almost any property. Uh, to pay the fund or not pay the fund. You know, I'm out in Hillwood, I don't have a sidewalk, I got a big ditch in my yard, I shouldn't have to pay. You know, I've got a four year old sidewalk that the city built, I shouldn't have to pay. I mean, and, and it's almost every scenario, yeah. you can make a pretty rational argument which says there are probably some issues with the sidewalk rule, uh, which we've been saying since it, it, it came about. But, and, and I do think you have unusually large frontage for a, a business, and, and I think that 
that we have, um, because of those types of situations and shot odd shaped lots, uh, sometimes tried to adjust that frontage, but yeah. I guess I'm still not. I guess I would suggest that Metro built this to the standard, but now there's a new, four years later, there's a different standard that we're all held to. Had they built it to the MCSP standard, well, you probably still would have been asked to pay into the fund, even if it no. was. No, if it were built to the MCSP standard, then our sidewalks are there. But then the sidewalk law says I don't, either. I don't think so. I think, and Ms. Lamb, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if we're doing a, if we're applying for a building permit, if the sidewalks that are there comply with the requirement, we don't, then we satisfy the sidewalk requirement. they make you pay into the fund? Interesting, it hadn't come up yet, but. I, I, th I think the answer is no because I. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you fully comply with the current standard, if a current project fully complies with the current sidewalk standard, then I think that's correct that you would not have to pay into the fund. Okay, but okay. yes, but right so now it doesn't. So um, my argument is Metro built to a standard, just not should have been the built in the, the Briley administration instead of the Dean administration, is what you're saying. <coughs> yes, sir. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, thanks, we're gonna close the public hearing discussion. <laughs> Why do you think they should pay? This is um, a significant renovation from what I've been reading here. This is not a non-for-profit. The councilwoman came and spoke and they got a gift, I think, from the planning department to allow them to only contribute on Murphy Road and not the whole thing, not both frontages. Other discussion? I think that's actually pretty consistent with what, for what we've done mm -hmm. yeah, previously. I mean, I, and I, it's a compelling argument that he's, that he's making. It's just, uh, it, it's an, I don't know, we just have, I think we have to draw the line somewhere. I mean. Well, I, 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 I do agree. Um, mostly the only, uh, I do think that they're getting consistent, um, results in terms of a corner lot, but I think that the, I do think that that kind of pie aspect of the corner elongates the Murphy Road frontage in a way that makes it, you know, longer than its neighbor. You know, the, the property to the right on that Could site plan drawing can probably you doesn't have 160 feet of frontage and wouldn't be penalized as much. And that is because of the topography and the pie. And if, if there was, if anybody else agreed that there was an argument for cutting that 160 by the, by some amount from that left hand Upper, upper left pie piece that includes public sidewalks. Um, and it looks like a billboard. I don't know what the billboard is. Um, then I, I might be inclined to, to support, you know, a, a 40 foot reduction of some sort to just because of that odd shape. But the rest of the frontage I think is. Do you have a motion then? Is that unreasonable? So, okay, I'm sorry, I have a question. Uh, it's for the administrator or, or the staff. How do, we, how do we count frontage in doing the calculation for the length of this, or for the amount of sidewalk for the in-lieu fund uh, when there's a curb cut? Is that counted in the length? Do you pay a fee on the curb cut? Or? So it's the, it's the frontage regardless of how much of it's actual sidewalk, or will be sidewalk. Make a well, I'll, I'll move that that we um, grant the variance for the sidewalk with the, I'm trying to find the planning department's recommendations, um, that the, uh, they maintain the existing sidewalk and uh, because of the odd shape lot and the unusual uh, 
length of the side on Murphy Road that it would be appropriate for them to pay for 120 feet instead of 160 and so that uh, because of that kind of point of the pie uh, okay. on the on the Murphy Road side um, that's the motion okay motion has been made and I'll second it um, any discussion seeing none all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye aye opposed passes good luck Ms. Lamb Next case is case 2019-113. Will the applicant please come forward? See the applicant here for case 2019-113. That's property at 216B Duke Street, Carla Newman. Okay. Uh -huh. Here she is. Okay. So this is another sidewalk variance request requesting um, to build two single family units without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Before you, you see the zoning map giving you the zoning of the property is R6A. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This now, I believe, are two alternative um, site plans, and I'll let the applicant address that. These are the site plans that were submitted to us. Oh. And then the... Um, Photography showing you the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 113? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make your desired presentation. Please identify yourself by name and address. Um, my name is Carla Newman and 216 Duke Street. Okay, why are we here? Um, requesting not to build the sidewalks or pay into the fund because the development at the end of the street has already paid. For oh, that's right. This is the one that Councilman Davis said that the developer is going to build the sidewalks on the entire street. So, questions for the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? We'll close the public hearing. Discussion? I think it's... I think we can grant it. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. How, how do we... How do we deal with the hardship issue? I think you just say that it'll be in compliance, like, you know, Ms. Lamb said. So just say, you know, the sidewalk will be built by the de other developer and it'll be in compliance. So just use that. So you make the motion. Okay, I'll make the motion that <laughs> we approve case 113, uh, letting them out of the sidewalk requirement or paying into the fund, as the councilman, Scott Davis, says he has gotten the developer down the block to pay for the sidewalk or build the sidewalks in this whole area. And would, could that be contingent on the developer completing that sidewalk within three years? Okay, sure. Okay, I'll, well, I'll, I'll make that motion. If it, who wants to second it? I mean, it, it, it's, if, if, if the developer builds a sidewalk that's compliant, they wouldn't be here. Yep. They say the plans are there. Yeah. The and the council think, person says it's happening. And I think it, it, if it were there, it would be fine. I think there just needs to be, con I don't think yep. the, the okay. applicant gets Three out. Years. Okay. Um, I've made the motion. Is there a second? Motion's been, motion is made properly second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> okay. Four to one. Ms. Lamb, next case. Good luck. Thank you. I know. I know we lose quorum. So quickly. Next case is case 2019-116 involving property at 2340 Spring Branch Drive. Is the appellant here on this particular case? Spring Branch Drive, 116, are you here? This is the zoning map showing you the zoning of the property is RS40. This is the aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan for the proposed project. And then finally, the uh, current conditions of the property in the photographs. Can you stay? Okay. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 116? <coughs> We're not going to get Anything else? All right. So each side will have 10 minutes to make your desired presentation. Please identify yourself by name and address. Note that this is a cumulative 10 minutes so that everybody will be sharing this. Okay. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Board, my name is Will Radford. I'm located at 1703 Fifth Avenue North. And I'm Sinceria Radford, located at 1703 Fifth Avenue North. Okay, why are we here? We are here seeking to request a special exception uh, to operate a community center. Okay, first of all, did you have a community meeting? 
Yes. yes, we did. Okay, good. So we had a community meeting that was held at the Madison Police Precinct mm -hmm. on last Wednesday from 6 to 7.30. We had 11 community members come out and sign the community sign-in sheet. There we took note of concerns primarily with um, if a special ex exception is granted, how will it apply to the property behind ourselves as owners? So if the property was sold next, and I'll absolutely uh, defer to the other party as they speak for themselves, but uh, our, our takeaway was there was concern about um, what happens with longevity, the perpetuity after something is decided uh, regarding a special exception. Well, usually these things go with the land, but it's not uncommon, or it's not unheard of, I should say, for us to give the, the special exemption to the owner so that if, am I, am I right? Board. Sure. So, you know, if, if that's a condition that would appease the the neighbors, we would certainly... So if you okay sold the property, somebody else have to come back and ask for the same thing or something different? Yeah, correct. That's what we convey, but uh, we're not the authority on it, so I point taken, I think they want to get that and maybe other questions answered. We okay. Just Why do you want to do this? Um, so the this property at Spring Branch is one that um, is a unique property. As you look at it through the situation, it is in a neighborhood, but it uh, is a completely different property. But it presents itself as an ideal location to do renewal work. Uh, my, myself, as well as Ms. Rafford, are in the nonprofit community. Uh, one of the challenges that we have as nonprofit um, operators is finding space to do retreats. Uh, one, it's incredibly expensive, but as Nashville has grown, it's become incredibly crowded and less available. And so at this property, which again, as we go through it, if you don't mind, if you can click through the slides, you get a sense of what makes this unique, although it's where it's located. So. Just the first slide, please, I'm sorry. Uh, our primary goal is to preserve the natural aspects of the property. It's to preserve the home as is and to provide a service to the nonprofit as well as religious community, which we are a part of. Next slide. You want to add anything? The unique pieces of this property is an exceptionally large site. Um, actually, it's about, it's about eight acres. There's a sliver that's not shown in the original metro plan that is shown in the site plan as we get to it. It's uh, a large home, uh, five bedrooms, five bathrooms, racquetball court, swimming pool, circular drive, several things that already lend itself to um, providing care and renewal and retreat for uh, community members. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows a, one of the first unique pieces is the steep slopes of the site. So as you can see, um, I don't know if you can zoom in there, but even if you can't, you can see that the shaded area uh, has steep slopes, which means that this property is exceptionally high based on the other property. So it sits not only about 300 to 400 yards from the rear of the other homes, um, but it also sits several feet above those homes um, in this unique location. Next slide, please. Uh, we are aware that the existing zoning is defined, as you can see here, I won't read it to you. Uh, originally, in looking at this pro project, we went through highest and best use analysis, not uh, attempting to put just our thought on it, but first discovering what else, what all can happen with the site. Next slide, please. On this site, you'll go. You'll see the three things that we, at three questions we asked in meeting with planning, uh, in meeting with the zoning examiner as well, and that we've ruled out as a result of those meetings. Could it be a bed and breakfast? No. Could it be multifamily? No. Could it be a traditional subdivision? Didn't like that one as much. So I want to demonstrate that it's not again a single use, single goal, just from a developer, but it's from an uh, interested party in owning this property and trying to create the highest and best use but all three of these things were ruled out as a result of working with planning staff. And this information you have here is the direct email from planning staff's front counter. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> unfortunately, the limited language that you'll see in the third bullet recreation center um, is sort of what fits here. Uh, of, of course, if you're a neighbor and you hear recreation center or community center, that may be something that gives you pause, but for us, it's about creating a space for renewal and working with nonprofits and serving that community, and this is the language that we have, recreation center and community center. But the planning staff still said, I mean, they, they even said that this was not an acceptable use. The, I think the planning, sta planning staff's comments, and I'd ask you to read that, please. Well, they, the, planning, the planning report on this, spring, uh, 2340 Spring Branch Road, is to disapprove the request because it's not an appropriate use 
in this residential area. Recreation centers are not identified as an appropriate use in the T3 uh, suburban neighborhood maintenance land use policy, which is intended to preserve uh, and enhance existing residential neighborhoods and supports primary residential, primarily residential uses. Well, Additionally, the site uh, is located in the interior of the neighborhood with one access off of a local residential street. For these reasons, staff recommends disapproval of this special exception. Right, so there are two th things <coughs> that I'd like to say in response to that. And A, we did take note of that, but A, it being deep into the neighborhood. Um, this is, unfortunately, you can't access Gallatin Road, again, through to the unique circumstances of the site. It's just not possible, but it's less than a mile. It's actually 0 0.8 uh, miles from Gallatin Road. And in normal conditions, that's not considered deep into the neighborhood. That's walkable distance to a bus stop, a walkable distance to public transit. Uh, in addition to that, the topography of this site, which makes it a unique site, is different than me building a community center next door to my neighbor. The landscape buffer here is beyond sufficient. Uh, if we can pull up two slides from here, please. One more, one more, one more, one more. <laughs> well, uh, let's go back one more, I'm sorry. I was looking for a number, but it's written down. Okay, right here. So unfortunately you can't see it here, but the reason we zoomed out here is every lot that's adjacent to the south of this property, again, is at least 300 feet from where this is. In talking with planning, we understand and agree if you're building something next to a neighbor, uh, if you're building something within 200 feet from a neighbor, that would be obtrusive, it would be invasive. This site, again, is situated at least 40 feet higher than those homes, at least three to 400 yards, I'm sorry, feet um, behind those homes. Our understanding in talking about planning is that it was not in what was permitted and the land use language of recreation center did not fit and there was not a category for retreat center. However, that's the reason that we are before you. We want to do what the T4 neighborhood maintenance plans, T3 neighborhood maintenance plan says. We want to preserve the existing structure as is. We want to preserve the existing land as is. We want to preserve the existing trees as is. We just want to have an added function of the property to serve other nonprofits like those that we support, where you could get 10 or 12 people to retreat for a weekend, meet in a, in a location such as this, enjoy the nature without paying exorbitant cost. Albeit that is, albeit that is not f the language that we have to choose from, but that is what the goal is and that is the reason we're asking for an exception. Again, you cannot get from Gallatin to this structure because of the topography and the commercial, um, commercial elements in front to the direct west of what you see here. Who is your council member? Um, Doug Pardue. Doug Thank Pardue. You. Thank you. And have you reached out to the councilman? Doug Pardue yes. was present at the meeting. Um, we've had two meetings with him prior to that meeting. Um, he came out as well as made comments. I would say he... Um, he didn't directly oppose it. He just said, you know, one concern that he felt like the community would have would be traffic. And he said as long as they feel like traffic wouldn't be a problem in their community, then he, well, let, he let didn't me ask you that. issue. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. But, oh, you're fine. Uh, and I, and I, I know it's irritating when you're trying to go through the, in a flow to present something, but let, let me get to what I think you touched on and will be a point with the neighbors. What what are the hours and days of operation? And and if that is a sticking point, is it something that you're willing to agree to in, in the exception uh, that we give you if, if we make that a condition? Like, you know, is, is it just going to be weekends? Is it? No, so it's on an as-needed basis. The, the idea behind the retreat center is really focusing on small organizations and nonprofits. And so, um, so the idea is that we are providing a space for those specific um, categories of people. And most of the time, you know, the retreat would be, it could be a day retreat uh, where it's only three or four hours. It could be um, where it's a two day retreat, but it's nothing that is seven, you know, days a week, um, 24 hours a day. Although we're open um, for reservations. reservations, it's not like it's a bed and breakfast or a so hotel we, where it would be every single day. Kind so of if, for instance, if there were a, 
So, you know, for instance, would if you, you guys you, wanted to come on a retreat, right? So, you know, well, they might. <laughs> Two <laughs> of us leaving. are leaving if we haven't made that clear. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the concerns, and, and we'll hear from opposition, uh, but this, I've heard a few of these cases. Uh, what will the traffic be like? I mean, I think people are interested in hearing, you know, it sounds like it's not a call center. People are coming here f uh, for a That's meeting and they're leaving mm -hmm. it, in, but it's not people, there's, you know, there won't be a flow of traffic in and out. Exactly. So yeah. th I think those kind of things, if you could address those. So, and we didn't get to, to this at the meeting, but uh, if outright right now we could tear the structure down, outright we can build eight houses, five bedroom, five bathroom houses. That puts, and two of those could be duplex. So that puts tw 10 structures on this site and that could be three to five people per house. So that's 30 to 50 people, five, four, two to three cars per structure. Of course, it's less than that. So just as a starting point, I think it's important if it's eight acres, one house per acre, two and one and two family dwellings, with 25% of those being duplexes, that would equate to 10 structures or 10 living units, which would equate to three, 30 to 50 people. We expect it to be less than 30 to 50 people. We expect it to be less than two cars per 10 houses, 20 cars. So while I don't wanna give a number and say, yes, right in the stand, exception that it's five people and five cars, Monday through Wednesday from six to seven, I do wanna say our intent is to create a center that is less invasive than if we built the eight homes, which we'd be entitled to build right now outright. Do you want? Oh, go. Do you want to reserve some of your time oh, for absolutely rebuttal? reserve okay. uh, the last three minutes okay. for? Um, okay. Um, so let's rebuttal. hear from the opposition. Please come forward. Those in opposition, this is your time to speak. State your name, address, why you're opposed to this. There are four chairs up here and the other people should sit in the first row. So please fill in the four chairs if you're intending to speak. Get us started. Name, address, why you're opposed. Um, I'll begin. I'm Carol England. I reside at 2301 Marsha Drive and the proposed site is within uh, sight uh, of my property. My neighbors, we had many neighbors here earlier today who had to leave for other obligations. We also had many neighbors who wrote to you, people who are not able to attend meetings personally. So the implication- We have seven letters of opposition in okay, our file. The implication that not many people are in opposition is, is not accurate. There, our neighborhood at large is opposed to this proposed establishment of a business in what is a residential neighborhood. Um, if the business is described as a community center, and as you know, that's a very broad description. It could permit many uses um, that are incongruent with the character of our neighborhood. The neighborhood is currently zoned for single family homes, not duplexes, on one acre lots. So the property in question could add um, six more homes. It could not add duplexes. If that were to happen, um, that would be in keeping with current zoning. As is, um, there are many, many properties available nearby in Madison that are vacant. We would love as a neighborhood to see those properties be, um, be used for a community center and be thriving rather than stealing residential property from our quiet neighborhood. I'm Stephanie Sturdivant. I live at 352 Cumberland Hills Drive. Um, I just wanted to speak to the fact they said that this wasn't act that deep into the neighborhood. Um, he mentioned 0.8 miles from Gallatin Road. I think the whole North Side Drive, which is our main road, is maybe a mile long, if that. So it is deep into our neighborhood. Um, we have very peaceful neighborhood and this would not be in character with the residential homes there. 
um, we'd like to keep this neighborhood exactly that, a residential neighborhood. Next, please. I'm Sue Sturdivant, uh, 352 Cumberland Hills Drive. My husband and I bought our home there in 1975, and uh, reason being, it's quiet. They're all dead end streets. There's only one way out of the neighborhood. Uh, that's Northside Drive. And um, any traffic will affect us for sure. But this is a unique neighborhood uh, in that it is all dead end streets. And we do have property on acre lots and two or three acre lots. And this particular property was built by, um, that they're uh, talking about the retreat center was built, that was owned by originally uh, the Phillips, Randall Phillips Sr., who is founder of Phillips Property. And um, they said at the meeting the other night that this was going to be a 24-7 and they could have, you know, consecutive meetings, two or three day meetings and then another meeting come in. So there's no control over noise or traffic in the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, this is a retreat for all of us that live there, our homes are. And uh, we would like to keep our quiet neighborhood the way it is. Okay. Next. Hi, my name is Phyllis Carpenter and I'm representing me and my dad. We own the property of Northside and Spring Branch right on the corner. My dad built that house over 50 years ago. He's 95 years old a World War II veteran and still lives there and still is able to function on his own. Uh, the traffic coming in and out of there could create some issues with uh, all the neighbors that are around that have aged, that have bought the houses and have built the houses and live in that area. It is one way in, one way out. The Phillips driveway, as we call it, that's right at the end of our street. It's one lane up a hill. Um, and one way out. There has been issues before with the fire at the end of the, the street and the house, and the fire trucks completely blocked the road. No way in, no way out for any other emergencies. So we request you to please deny this issue. Okay, who's next? Uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Sandra Garner. I have a power of attorney for my mother, Joy Hood, who resides at 2313 Spring Branch Drive. We have the following concerns. The 2340 address is a single family residence. The existing building referred to in the appeal is a home. Uh, the topography hardship they mentioned is, it exists because the neighborhood was designed with a single road access and it was never intended or designed for commercial business use. The appellant's land use seems to propose use of the residence as a hotel with amenities. Uh, the overnight occupancy proposed without owner presence is a concern. The maximum occupancy is not de defined. The property use is broadly subjective. It appears to be for rent to whomever for whatever. Uh, the traffic increase for customers and deliveries is a concern. There are presently three existing community centers located within five miles of this address in Madison, Goodlettsville, and Old Hickory. And these centers completely serve the needs of the individuals and small business communities. Uh, there is a concern about the impact on property value. And while there seems to be no benefit to the neighborhood uh, for this venture, it does seem that there is a potential for harm to the existing residents. And, we respectfully request that the variance not be approved. Thank okay. you. Next. My name's John Hood. I uh, have an ownership interest in the uh, 2313 Spring Branch Drive property. And like everybody else, we're concerned about a commercial recreation center in a residential area. We're also uh, concerned about the increased traffic on a local dead end neighborhood streets. We're uh, concerned that the distance of the structures to be used as a commercial recreation center are too close as defined in the zoning ordinance to the adjacent residentially zoned properties. Uh, the ordinance says the buildings have to be 100 feet from the property line. Uh, the uh, structures, even if you took a wild guess at it, uh, is, the house is 55 feet from the property line and the racquetball courts 
like 26 feet from the property line. So that's a problem right there. The, um, we're concerned that the 11 foot wide asphalt driveway that uh, leads from Spring Ridge Drive, it's gotta cut through the uh, residential PUD that's got the apartments in it. They might very well need to amend the PUD to you know, get true access to the property. I don't really know about that, but um, uh, you know, we're also concerned, uh, I've looked at some public, uh, some public uh, record history. The property might be on a septic system and uh, we're concerned that a retreat center would put uh, undue burden on a septic system. It might cause groundwater protection problems. We don't, but I couldn't verify through Metro Water Services whether indeed they were hooked to the public sewer, but uh, I don't think they are. And uh, let's see, the overnight accommodations were a problem without a, the required owner-occupied short-term rental permits. And we're just concerned about the negative impact of a commercial use next to the existing residential properties. You know, the, what kind of impact that'll have on the property values. And uh, also concerned about the introduction of uh, non-residents into the neighborhood. You know, the impact on crime. We don't know uh, what what goes on there, but uh, we're we're just concerned and we would ask that you uh, not approve this special exception, so. Okay, anyone else that wishes to speak in opposition? So we, before you leave, uh, is, are there any conditions that would that you would find that would make this acceptable? No. Uh, no, I don't think so. They need more of a SP type. There, there's such a vague a recreation center or um, it, it's their uses. Uh, any commercial use of it seems uh, seems out of place. Applicant will come back. I have three minutes and I think ten seconds. This is rebuttal time. You get to respond to what you heard. I well, better start quick. Um, thank you. Um, all the comments have been noted. I'd like to respond to several of them. Uh, one, that driveway access was a part of the 1989 PUD, and that has been um, grandfathered in with the property, and that transfers as well. So the ability to access the sites, not a, a problem. Um, two, the traffic again will be less than if we built five, if we built the 10 structures, and the, t the maintenance, as well as the existing zoning allows for single and two family houses, two family on 25% of those, which would be four units in lieu of the two, which would be a total of 10 structures. That would put more than 50, up to 50 people on the site, up to two cars per home, up to 20 cars. What we're asking for is less than that. We're not um, asking to operate a business that's 24-7, 24-7, we wanted to be able to take reservations without limitations. So if a nonprofit is working and they want to do a retreat on the weekend, we can do it. They wanted to do a retreat in the, a day retreat, Monday through Friday, we can do it. We're just asking not to have um, a limited hours, as not hours, of course, 10 o'clock at night, you shut down like any uh, center would, but the ability to accommodate the need from the community we want to serve. Um, two, the deep in the neighborhood concept, again, is clear in that point eight is a walkable distance, and it's not that it's uh, at the end of some subdivision and it's, uh, it's remote. Um, three, the distance from the other structures, while it's 50 feet from the landscape buffer, which we show it beyond our property line, there's another 300 feet before you hit the back door of the next unit. So it's not uh, looking into your neighbor's yard. It's not people walking across um, or through a fence to mess with someone's uh, belongings. It's situated completely by itself. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, it took me a while to even notice the other homes because it's so remote and the topography and the lift of the house is so much higher than that, that you're actually looking clear over everything. You can actually see the river from there. Um, the last piece, we actually want to preserve the peace and the nature of the, of the community. We, we want a retreat space to serve nonprofits and small businesses, not to create congestion or noise or difficulty, which we already have in the city. Uh, if you can go to the last two slides, or the, yeah, go through the last few. No, uh, this next one. Uh, this is what we're not. We're not a hotel, we're not a campground, we're not a public community center, we're not a wedding event venue. That's not what we're after. Uh, we want to meet a core need that we have ourselves, as uh, the next slide please, as business owners where 
uh, we own a Montessori school and we own a grocery store. And when you do team building with team pe people that are on your teams, you need spaces that you can secure in advance. You know that they're there. We don't have that. We found an opportunity that we believe will allow us to create and share that. And that's why we're here asking for the special exception. To be clear, we're asking for the special exception to use an existing property in its present condition to serve a different need in the community. We don't want to build a new road. We don't want to enlarge the road. That's we want time. to use existing. Okay. Questions for the applicant? One question. Is it true that you're on a septic tank or do you have public? It's true the structure through our home uh, inspection has two septic tanks and both of them are sized well and both of them have new leader lines um, in the last four to five years. That was part of our uh, concern as well and we've found the answer that we need on that. Okay. Any other questions? I read something in the correspondence there may be overnight guests, limited overnight guests, but I think you just said you would shut down at 10. No, uh, what, what I'm saying is that um, as you would have a group that travels from Franklin there and they're spending the night there, that 10 o'clock we wouldn't, it's not a motel where people are driving up all night, can we check in? It's reservations. We know who's checking in. We've accommodated that group in the morning as they're checking in. They are there. We're meeting their need. And there is a business owner occupying the property. It's not a Airbnb where you send people with the code. That's not the, con that's not the condition in this business model. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing discussion. Well, you know, I, I applaud them for their existing businesses and, and success. And I think that the idea is an interesting one that um, may have a, a real need in the community. I think they've got a clear vision for it, but to me, special exceptions um, like that are projects that typically come to us with uh, neighborhood support, council support, uh, and certainly planning commission support. And the thing that, that um, I, I don't think that, that we've ever uh, approved, I can't recall a, a special exception we've approved against planning, um, you know, and strong neighborhood opposition. And so that's, that's what troubles me. It's, it, it, uh, I do agree with the neighbor that said uh, it seems more appropriate for an SP, uh, which would be much more well-developed and, uh, you know, and, and go through, you know, the, a, a more rigorous process. Uh, and if it were to come back as a special exception request, I think it would almost have to have, uh, some neighborhood support and planning approval and uh, the council support. I think that's just, to me, part of that aspect of a special exception, which says, you know, that it won't damage the the neighborhood. And planning has said it would, and the neighbors have said it would. And so I, okay. I, have, a tr I have trouble with it. Any other comments? Well, I think the intent is well intentioned, but it is difficult to approve something for the reasons that you stated. Yeah, and I have to give it in, in concept, I think it's a pretty, pretty cool idea. Um, you it's not my support. neighborhood, and it's and it's uh, in okay. planning. Saying Anyone that. have a motion? Any other? Any other thoughts that you all have? No nope. motion. I too, like you, are troubled that we don't have council member support, and we don't have planning meeting support. We don't have neighbor support. Um, I love the idea. I, I know about a retreat center that I've been to that was wonderful. It's in another neighborhood. But I wouldn't want this on my street. So, well, I mean, I think given that, the, you know, I'll move that we uh, don't approve the special exception and uh, with the comments that, um, and I think they have been made, of what it would take uh, for us to reconsider a special exception for this and Again, uh, I think it's a good idea, but it's it's not uh, appropriate for us to, I think, at this point, I approve it, so I'll move that we disapprove it. Okay, and motion's been made. Is there a second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Ms. Lamb. Okay. 
management plan. Uh, so members of the public, two of our board members now have conflicts and they're required to leave. That leaves three members of the board. By law, we cannot proceed because we will not have so, a quorum. But so before we leave, I want to hand the gavel over to my friend and colleague, David Taylor. Huh. Cheers. Congratulations. <laughs> You'll do well chairing the BZA. Thank well, you. we'll see. Thank you, members, for 13 years of service here. Thank I'm going to miss you all. And John Michael, thank you for this sign and recognition of 13 years here. And I will see you all out in the city. David Ewing out. Thank you. Sign. I want to see this up in your yard. So for, all for, for, for members of the well, public, if your case was on today's docket because we lost a quorum, you will be moved to the next meeting on April 4th. You'll do well. And, and we will hear so, you. So same we time, will. same place, April 4th. Yeah. In this room. We lost quorum, so all the cases have been moved to this to the next hearing date. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.